On a cold January night in 1950, a military transport plane rumbles through the Alaskan skies. On board, 44 people en route to Montana. Two hours into the flight, they communicate with base. And then, they vanish. No one knows what happened or what they saw, only that they have never been seen again. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. All right, guys, here we go. All right, ready to roll. The team's investigation begins outside Snag, Canada, right at the edge of the triangle, heading toward the site of the last reported communication of the missing C-54. All right, we're on our way to the coordinates you gave me. Weather's looking pretty good. No single event captures the mystery of the Alaska Triangle better than this lost C-54. When one person goes missing, that's strange. But when a whole plane load of people vanishes, now that's a real mystery. It's been 65 years since this plane went missing. I think it's incredible that really no sign of it, no trace of it at all. 70 to 100 planes that actually searched for this thing. Actually had a couple of planes that went down during the search. you think the melt would push something off. Something would be found at some point. The Douglas C-54 was a large plane for its time. The four-prop transport had a wingspan of 117 feet and a max takeoff weight of over 35 tons. Capable of transporting 50 troops, it was at near capacity for its fateful trip. Somehow, it did not leave a shred of evidence behind. The fact that it just disappeared is mind-boggling, really. As an investigator, my initial guess is that the plane just crashed. That's the easy answer, but it does leave a lot of questions. Why no distress call? And why were no pieces of the plane ever found? The Alaska Triangle is a huge area, but this is a massive plane. It really feels like someone should have found something by now. Have, have you ever seen any airplane wreckage out here? I have, actually. Lots of, uh, almost every pass has quite a few wreckages. Small and big planes alike. Why does this area have so many crashes? Well, with the bad weather, it can, uh, really push you into a sticky situation where uh, you end up having to drive it into the ground, unfortunately. The number of air disasters in Alaska is staggering. Over the past decade, nearly 1,200 craft have gone down, almost four times the average per state, despite having only 0.2% of the U.S. population. One reason there's so many crashes here in Alaska is there's so many inexperienced pilots here. There are places within the state you can only get to by plane, and there's too many people doing it. Another reason is the dangerous wind shear that can come off the mountains. Even an experienced pilot could have problems with this. In native lore, mountains are often looked at as gods that can judge you. They can either protect you or strike you down. So we're coming right up on the location where the missing C-54 had its last radio transmission and essentially disappeared from radar, right up here in this little valley. Look how close we are to the mountain. Another reading there again. We're holding pretty steady at 2.5 to 5. Ken Gerhard has an EMF meter, a device commonly used to measure electric flow and power lines. 
but it can also detect electromagnetic radiation in the atmosphere. A small amount of background radiation is normal, but any change in level suggests a hidden anomaly. Have you ever had any experiences with any magnetic disturbance desire? Yeah, a little bit on the compass. Every once in a while, it can uh, spin on you. Why would you think that that would occur? I was hoping maybe you guys could tell me. Is that where we are about now, Jack? For the last radio transmission came. The weather. Wow. The white wall right there, huh? Yeah, I can't. Look at the visibility here. You can't see anything beyond uh, a quarter of a mile. Can we get some readings here on this, Ken? Hey, hold on here, guys. Weather's changing on us real quick in this valley. Look at that. Oh, it's the first time it's reacted like that. It's kind of like a solid... Run back through that last valley. Yeah. Oh, no, holy crap, look at that. Did you no. see that? Just spiked red. Right off the charts. Hold on. Yeah, everybody hold on. Feel that? Yeah. Crazy. Hey. Wow, yeah, we're definitely hitting some turbulence now. The whole thing's shaking. My ears are popping. Whoa! See that? I'm getting a pretty active reading right now. Sorry guys, this weather creeped out of nowhere. I gotta take us back. Oh, whoa. Man, that chopper ride was utterly terrifying. I mean, you had the sudden surge of turbulence, there were the electromagnetic spikes. I honestly don't even really know what all that meant or even if those two things are related. According to meteorological models, violent weather is caused by pressure differentials, not electromagnetism. Were the EMF spikes before the storm just a coincidence? Or is there more to it? It seems like a lead. Got my adrenaline pumping there for a second, man. Got mine going. Now my heart's going. I'm sweating. You know, back in the 1970s, there was a study conducted to look at different areas around the planet where there were high incidences of missing airplanes and ships. And a lot of it was related back to geomagnetic properties. But there's this theory that perhaps we're dealing with these sort of vortex areas. A vortex is an area of intense concentrated spinning. Natural examples are whirlpools in water or the air of a tornado. It's been speculated by Einstein, among others, that they can also form in the fabric of space-time and connect different areas of the universe. A vortex is suspected in the infamous Bermuda Triangle, which has claimed planes and boats for centuries. In fact, Abnormal readings have been recorded in 12 triangular regions around the world, known as the vile vortices. Could the Alaska Triangle be number 13? Could a vortex account for the missing C-54 and strange readings in this area? You know, I'm, I'm eager to figure out exactly what's going on to uh, explore the vortex theory. See if there's any possibility like something like that could exist over Alaska. The vile vortices all feature strange disappearances. But what's interesting is that they all match up geometrically along the same lines of latitude. On the surface, Alaska doesn't really fit the pattern. But maybe the Alaska Triangle represents one of these areas that's yet to be discovered that features a similar connection. The team feels fortunate to escape the initial phase of their investigation in one piece. But pilots have been reporting anomalies and possible vortices in Alaskan aviation for decades. Jeffrey and his dad, Earl, were on a routine flight when they experienced something incredible. It was a beautiful day. You could see for miles. It was just gorgeous. And then we saw these clouds, and they were swirling in this very strange motion. We really hadn't seen anything like it. And then there was this wind that just shot up. It was sucking us towards it. Somehow, he was able to balance out the plane. We both got out of our life. Just pure luck that day that both of us got out. Ken's idea of the vortex theory is very interesting, but this is Alaska. There's a lot of dangerous mountains and very crazy weather. So Tommy and I are headed to Anchorage to meet with a geophysicist named Gary Hufford. How are you doing, Gary? Pretty good, and you? Good, thanks. We want to find out all the different reasons why this plane might have gone down. This is within this area where the C-54 went down right on the Alaska-Yukon border. And after two and a half hours of communication off and on with Elmendorf, uh, 
they basically disappeared. And they reported their last time that they thought they were over the little town of Snag. Where the problem is, is that if they were not on that route, and they were actually deviating a bit, just to the south are some of the nastiest coastal mountains one can find in the world. End up in what we call the coffin corner. You've got strong winds, and with strong winds comes turbulence. You have winds coming down gaps. You have aircraft icing, and it means that if you take a flight like that, you may in fact run into some really nasty weather. If it's up in these mountains, the amount of snow they get a year is phenomenal. You could have had that plane crash in those mountains on a day when it snowed four or five feet, which would have hidden the plane very, very rapidly. Very, very quickly. Is there a connection between the weather in Alaska and the magnetic fields that uh, we have here? It's certainly one of those things you have to look at. It is certainly something that you notice that pilots up here are really aware of magnetic deviation because up here there's a number of things that don't work. What would that have done to their natural instruments that they're using in the, in the cockpit at that time? The biggest problem when you see the magnetic storms is the compass. You'll see it bounce around. If you're trying to go north to a target, you're going to end up northeast. And man, all of a sudden you find out you're 40 miles, 60 miles too far to the east. Hearing Gary talk about planes that go off course and winding up in places called the coffin corner makes me think that this is just a crash. I don't think he'll support the vortex theory, but there's some evidence for it, so I have to ask the question. I was wondering if you could give us your opinion on the possibilities of vortexes. Well, that one's a tough one to call. Um, it's certainly one of those things you have to look at. There are some clues that say we have magnetic field changes. When I look at the magnetic vortex possibility, this is an area that we should be looking at. You hear the numbers about accidents, and Alaska is always many times above the, the norm for the United States, and yet we only have 0.2% of the nation's population. The question is, what's going on? Alaska, a vast expanse of untouched lands where more than 3,000 people per year go missing. Are the disappearances related to the strange legends of the Alaska Triangle? Witnesses claim visions of hairy beasts, carnivorous gnomes, even a mysterious vortex in the sky. In 1950, a military C-54 vanished with 44 personnel on board. The team has learned that magnetic anomalies might have something to do with the disappearance. Is it possible Magnetic deviations created by a vortex might drive a plane fatally off course, or even make it disappear completely. While Ken Gerhardt researches that possibility, former cop Jax Atwell and folklorist Tommy Joseph have a meeting with aviation historian Rob Stapleton. Hey, hello, how are you? Good. They want to learn more about the military's initial search efforts in January of 1950. Here you go. There's some bedtime reading for you. It talks about uh, C-54. There's also information in here about Operation Mike. Operation Mike was the code name for the search and rescue effort to find the C-54. Named for the missing plane's commander, First Lieutenant Kyle McMichael, Operation Mike utilized 7,000 military personnel and covered more than 55,000 square miles. It lasted for nearly three weeks, but found no sign of the aircraft. You know, when they were determining the search pattern, if they considered alternative things like the magnetic fields and other issues like that that might have led it further off course? Um, that's kind of interesting. I would say that, you know, the airplane probably encountered a heavy mining area, and there have been a lot of reports of real strange magnetic activity. Over here on the 40-mile country, there were some people that said that they had heard an airplane flying low, and there was a ranger that even thought that it, he heard a thud after it flew over. Rob's theory is interesting. He thinks that magnetism might have played a role in the crash, but not as part of a vortex. He's saying that a high concentration of metal within the mining area of the 40-mile country could have thrown the plane's instruments off. This is definitely an area we should check out. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Pleasure's well, all lady. mine. Based on the reports of magnetic disturbances and witness testimonies, the team heads out to 40 Mile Country, named for the nearby 40 Mile River, 
to search for any signs of the missing C-54 plane. I'm gonna keep a lookout, see if I can see anything. Probably a long shot, but who knows? Maybe mining areas are a bigger problem for planes than we thought. The mining industry has long been a cornerstone of the Alaskan economy. Zinc, lead, gold, and iron have been pulled from the rugged mountains in 40-mile country by the ton. Iron especially is a ferromagnetic metal that could affect the compasses of a passing aircraft. It's obviously one of the most treacherous places that you could possibly be flying over. I mean, it's probably treacherous air currents that kind of float off of these mountains and so forth. Okay, we are definitely now in the area you requested. Hey, look up here! What's this? Looks like something's buried in the snow. What is that? See that? Hey, Paul, can you land us down there? I'll get you as close as I can, but I'm gonna have to drop you off and move down to a safer elevation for a while. When we jump off that helicopter, we immediately plunge in a couple feet of snow. I know Ken is chasing the vortex theory. But when I look at this large valley, I can see how a plane could disappear out here. So the chopper dropped us off about 200 yards from the object we sighted. I'm really glad we have proper gear because this is a barren and unforgiving landscape. Anything could happen out here. Here we are, guys. Not gonna be able to walk in this stuff, that's for sure. I think we're at the spot. Yeah, this is a perfect starting point. Uh, let's see. Good thing we have these shoes, man. Could that be a piece of our plane? Maybe. Holy crap. Citation. Ugh. Looks like the hood of a snow machine. What would a snow machine be doing out here, man? That doesn't make any sense. We're in the middle of nowhere. You know, hunters, trappers, they'd come up this far. I'm sure they could get up here, yeah. Well, we're in a right area to search. We devised a plan to scan the area, but we're also going to utilize all the instruments that we brought along, in particular the metal detector and the EMF reader, to see if we can find anything that's buried under the snow. This is really tough terrain. We're spreading out so we can cover as much ground as possible. But this is a huge area. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Hey, Ken, over here. Come check out these readings. Jumping. Yeah? Color in there. Mm. There we go, there we go. Oh, you yeah, see that? Yeah, there we go. Jumping off the charts. For the second time in this investigation, the EMF meter picks up strange jumps in electromagnetic radiation levels. If the meter was picking up the metal in this area, the reading should stay consistently high. But the wild, inconsistent fluctuations suggest some mysterious variable beyond just rocks. Similar erratic readings have been recorded in the Bermuda Triangle. Could these spikes reveal the opening and shutting of a vortex? There is a scientific precedence for this process black holes. A black hole begins with a collapsing star that explodes in a supernova, which releases massive amounts of radiation. The inner core then collapses, creating a vacuum so strong not even light can escape. Could the same process happen on a much smaller scale right here on Earth? It is possible that vortices have been seen by native peoples for thousands of years. Mystical spirals can be found in the native artwork all over the Americas, all the way to Europe. Whatever inspired that art obviously made a lasting impression. Now, with regard to the vortex, I do have a theory that when the vortex opens, theoretically, it releases this huge amount of electromagnetic energy. But when it closes, and it would have to close quickly, it couldn't be open for a long time, or it would suck in everything, right? When it closes, you have kind of a dramatic reduction in electromagnetic energy. That type of energy might affect, you know, uh, aircraft, instruments, things like that, and cause them to crash. The vortex theory sounds cool, but until I see some hard evidence, like someone's actually recorded this thing, it's all just a bunch of talk to me. I think the plane can still be found. 
With the sun heading down, the team has to abandon their search for now. But in order to explore his vortex theory, Ken heads to meet with Melanie Hodgman, a fellow investigator of the unexplained. Ken Gerhard. Hi, Ken. Really nice to meet Pleasure you. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much for meeting me out here. Not a problem. Ken wonders if a vortex could act as a doorway through which planes in the Alaska Triangle could disappear. And if so, could the door go both ways? Wow, this is really breathtaking, Melanie. It is a beautiful view, but the whole state of Alaska, that's what I love about it here. The whole state looks like a postcard. I wanted to bring you to the site because I had the UFO sighting right over in this area. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. And we're right in the trajectory that that C-54 flight was taking in the 1950s. This revelation from Melanie about seeing a UFO here, this could be a game changer for our investigation. OK, so we're actually in the general vicinity right now. We're in the 1950s. A Douglas C-54 just disappeared. I wanted to bring you to the site because I had the UFO sighting right over in this area. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. I saw a light that was perfectly round, and it was really bright. And then it kind of split into two, turned red, and then the first one joined the second one, and it turned white again, and then it just was gone. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. I, I just, yeah. it's the first one that I've ever seen through a camera. Our universe is so immense, and I think these entities make be on a parallel line at the same time that we're here, and they, and they just have the secret. They know how to go from, from parallel to parallel. As strange as parallel universes sound, scientists at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland are testing this exact phenomenon. Using nearly 12 trillion teravolts, they hope to create a mini black hole that could be a portal to another dimension. If humans are this close to such a breakthrough, what about aliens? that are far more advanced. There are a lot of UFO sightings in Alaska. As a matter of fact, um, you can count hundreds and hundreds. Really? Yes. Melanie's sighting, along with the high number of UFOs in Alaska, now has me convinced that there's got to be more to this vortex. While Ken considers Melanie's UFO theory, Jax and Tommy pay another visit to aviation expert Rob Stapleton. Rob left us a message that he has some new information that might be relevant to our case. We're going to stop by and see what it is. You want to see what we found? Yeah. OK. Well, they don't look like airplane parts, though. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was the disappointing part. <laughs> so what was that message all about? Well, you know, uh, after you were here last time, I went back and did some more research at the University of Alaska. And I found between January 22nd and January 26th, 1950, there was UFO sightings during that time frame. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, UFO sightings. This is, this is interesting to me. Uh, um, what do you yeah, think there? Well, I found it kind of interesting because they uh, quoted a Air Force lieutenant colonel as actually spotting them from the military. So, you know, that's fairly credible. According to official reports, Lieutenant Colonel Lester F. Matheson was on Elmendorf Air Force Base, where the C-54's flight originated, when something caught his eye. He saw three orange-red objects moving together high in the air. They were shaped like cigars and flying in a curved line towards the north. The military ruled out any known aircraft, and the sightings happened just two days after the C-54's disappearance. Is there a connection to the sighting Melanie had decades later? The UFOs she reported were not cigar-shaped, or were they? A closer look reveals the two lights could have been a singular cigar-shaped craft. I think we need to talk with Ken about this and see what he thinks. This idea that UFOs may be involved adds a whole new level to our investigation. If there is a vortex, the idea of aliens being involved with it, that's huge. Alaska has long been known as a hotbed of UFO activity. It's consistently among the top states in the U.S. for sightings per capita. Why? With nine military bases in this state, it's possible many are simply misidentified government aircraft. But is there something else going on? 
Could extraterrestrials be invading this vast area and making planes go missing, including the C-54? The team wants to dig deeper into the data. Hey, Ken, how's it going? What have you been up to? Well, um, I've been kind of like logging some of these UFO sightings in Alaska. There's a whole bunch of them. Show us what you got here. According to the classified government files, the US intelligence actually took like an active interest in UFO sightings over Alaska from 1947 to 1950. So I mean, it was on their radar. So we got a couple of yeah, this... unusual occurrences. Let's start putting these on the map. The team plots sightings across Southeast Alaska, the area where the C-54 vanished. Is this all we have? Um, no, there's a bunch more. I mean, I'm just starting on this project well, right now. Why don't we now. put a couple more up and then maybe connect some dots? All right. We should check everything over the last 60 years. As they fill in the map, a telling pattern begins to emerge. We start to notice a cluster developing in one particular area, and it's a really remote area, which makes the high number of sightings really compelling. The UFO cluster is a bit off of the suspected flight path of the C-54. But when you consider the magnetic deviations that could have affected the instruments, it's possible the plane could have ended up there. Could this cluster of sightings be the focal point of the vortex, a portal where aliens travel into and out of our world and take those of us they wish? I think that's our spot right there. I think we need to gear up, man, as soon as possible. We need to get on it. In the skies of Alaska, planes go missing with alarming regularity. Is the Alaska Triangle home to a hidden vortex that caused the disappearance of a military C-54 in 1950? Ham radio enthusiast Walter Benally believes he's seen proof it exists. I live in a very remote area, and we use ham radio as a reliable means of communication. One day, I hear a call as a pilot in distress giving coordinates. I see that his flight plan's going right over my house. So I look out and I could see his plane. I hear a squelch on the radio. When I look back up, the plane's gone. It just disappeared. I can't explain it. We're flying to our UFO hotspot, and I'm really excited because we're finding a correlation between a high number of UFO sightings and the spot where this airplane disappeared. You guys all ready? All right. I'll see it. This desolate area only sees a handful of mountaineers each year, making the high rate of UFO sightings here even more remarkable. The interesting thing about this area, there are no regular flight paths here. So if people are seeing flying objects here, that's really strange. You realize just how the deep this snow gets sometimes. There could be literally anything buried under here. All right. Good spot? Yeah. We're at the area that we mapped out. It really holds a lot of promise based on all of the UFO reports. And I'm actually anxious to see what kind of readings we might get that might point to the existence of a vortex. What you got there, bud? Nada. Nothing at all? What do you think of that? This is the area where most of those UFOs were seen in the time period. I think this might be a good spot to play with our new toy. We've been using a lot of high-tech instruments in our investigation, but now we're going to take things up a notch because we've got a drone. So far, all the tests that we've done have been at ground level. But with the drone, we can test the atmosphere at higher altitudes. What's really cool is that it also takes readings of electromagnetic energy, and it'll send those back to our phone in real time. We are a go. What you got there, bud? Uh, looks normal so far. You gotta get it up there high. Whoa, this is weird. This is weird. What you got? It's spiking. It's spiking. Check it out. I'm looking at my app, and suddenly everything goes haywire. I mean, all the readings are off the charts. I've never experienced anything like this before in all my years of research. Man, this is, like, really strange. I got no eyes, guys. Where's our toy? 
I lost it. I can't I'm, see it. Man, I'm losing everything here. Tommy, you got anything? No, I just lost it. It was here a minute ago. It was just gone. I looked down it's at gone. the phone here, and it was completely gone. I don't hear anything either. I honestly have no idea what happened to the drone. It's the strangest thing I've ever experienced. I mean, one second it's there, the next second it's completely gone. Error, error. It's not possible, we lost it that fast. Error. So those readings just went off the charts and it's just gone. Uh, I don't know, man. Hey guys, look like a storm's coming in. These clouds are dropping. Oh, it's gonna crap. be snowing here soon. Call in Sam, we gotta get out of here. Losing our drone is a big setback. All the information is gone. Now we need to regroup and see where we go from here. With violent storm clouds closing in, the team knows they have to leave. They've experienced sudden Alaska weather changes once. They don't want to again. What do you guys think happened to the drone? Well, it just took off. I think uh, flew right out of range. It's really distressing. Because, I mean, obviously, we have a lot invested in that piece of equipment. You know, we don't have the drone anymore, so we're just going to have to kind of rethink things. It looks like the weather is getting uh, a little hairy here, so hang tight. Wow, this is crazy. Holy cow. I'm changing flight altitude and searching for a smoother pocket. Try to stay relaxed. Wow. Weather is ridiculous. We can't see anything here. This can't be good. This is pretty hairy. We're fast. Heading in right into a whiteout here. Okay, it looks like the change in the pitch has given us some positive stability. Thanks for hanging in there. The crazy part about being in a helicopter in this type of weather is you can feel everything. You can feel every wind gust, and it feels like you're going to slam in the mountain at any moment. Hey, guys, look. Who do you got? What do you got? What do you see? What is it, Jack? Possibly a fuselage, maybe a wing. Well, whatever it is, we need to get down there and check it out. Hey, guys, look. Look out here. Yes. What is it, Jack? Possibly a fuselage, maybe a wing. Well, whatever it is, we need to get down there and check it out. Is that a somewhere down here, Sam? Uh, yeah, we can take a look, but there's a ton of snow, so I'll have to drop you off a few hundred yards away. OK. So this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Probably aren't going to have much time down here, guys, so we have to work fast. This airplane wreckage might be the C-54. We could potentially be solving a mystery that's lasted for 60 years. All right, guys, stay tight. We're hiking across the glacier towards this plane wreckage, and it's extremely frustrating. It's taking us forever. The snow is very deep, it's very slippery, it's freezing cold out here, and we're totally exhausted at this point, but we just want to get there. This air is really thin up here. And because we know that the weather conditions can change in an instant, we've got to hurry up and get this thing done. We're almost there, guys. <sighs> that thing's pretty mangled. Any markings on it? Well, I mean, I see the uh, good old insignia of the USA. What do you think, guys? C-54? Maybe. It's definitely a military aircraft. It's amazing how well preserved it is. Look at the hoses still on there. As we get to the crash site, I've kind of got mixed feelings. I'm encouraged by the fact that this is obviously a US Air Force plane, so this could be the missing C-54. But on the other hand, I'm reminded about the tragedy that occurred here. People actually lost their lives in this accident. Knowing this is a military crash, the team avoids going inside the plane out of respect they start gathering information so they can report it to authorities. Hey, guys, I've got some numbers here on this uh, fuselage. I'm going to, maybe a serial number or something, I'm going to get a shot. Copy that. This is the engine compartment here. Side panel, totally gone. Got cables and pulleys. <sighs> yeah, I'm seeing some marking here on this, I believe, a wing piece here. Let's get a snuff. If this is the C-54, maybe with all this melting snow and the receding glaciers, it's uncovered the plane after all these years. The first thing I do when I get to the crash site is take some readings. I want to use my K2 meter to see if I pick up any electromagnetic anomalies in this location. I'm going to take some readings now. I'm curious to see. Activity. And the readings are off the charts. 
I'd say we're definitely in Vortex territory. We gotta get a shot of that. Look, there's some serial numbers on the side. It's like a part number or something. It was definitely a military plane, but I mean... Take a, take a shot of that right there. That's a pretty good sticker right above your head. Which one? This one? Yeah. Got it. Guys, we got five minutes till the helicopter's here. Let's roll through our checklist. Ken, you got all your readings? I got plenty of readings, man. Electromagnetic and radiation. All right, what we got here? We've got two motors and the wing and a fuselage. We got markings. Lots of serial numbers. Documented, all the serial Heart numbers, numbers documented. Yeah. Get some photos. We've collected a lot of important clues with regard to our downed aircraft, and we can show them to our aviation expert. But now we got to hightail it out of here fast before the weather gets bad again. Watch out for the blue ice, guys. That's Glacier. It could take you right out of here. Now, we're going to meet with Rob and get his expert opinion as to what this downed aircraft might be. guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, after you, sir. Hey. How you doing? Good, good. Long good time evening. no see. Yeah. All right. We brought our friend with us. This okay. Our, this is Ken. Ken, this is Rob. Rob, hey. nice to meet you, man. Yeah, nice to meet you. Great hat. Oh, hey, you good too. to see you again. Back at you. Yeah. All right, so what brings you guys here? So we were looking into those areas that you had pointed out in some of our research and stuff like that. And we were on our way back and just happened to visually see what it might, it might be our plane that we've been looking for. Oh, what do we got here? Well, we were hoping you could tell us. Hmm, interesting. All right. What else do you have to look at? Uh, there's one more. And then this one. We're hoping this might be our plane. Yeah, I think I can tell what that is. We're hoping this might be our plane. Yeah, I think I can tell what that is. I hate to tell you this, guys. It's not the right airplane. <sighs> well, that is really disappointing, guys. Extremely. It's a B-29 refueling version. There were actually two B-29s. The other one was coming back to uh, Anchorage, Elmendorf, and they, they ditched on a glacier. Rob has identified the craft as a known crash from the 50s, one of several during that decade, including the C-54. Well, this is really good news because if there's multiple air crashes in this particular area, this could be the vortex we've been looking for. The fact that we've had so many downed military aircraft in one specific area, and it's the same area where we've had all these UFO sightings, it's very intriguing. I think we need to do more testing in this area to see what's going on out here. I agree, but let's get up there before sundown. Yeah. Rob, thanks for your time, man. All right. After landing, we picked a spot near where we found the plane crash. We think it has a high probability of success for our investigation. We're going to take EMF readings and scan for UFOs. We'll see if we can get any evidence to show proof of the vortex. You guys need to keep your eyes open. Bears can still be out. It's been a real mild winter out here. Keep your legs turning, guys. I know the air is getting thin, but one leg after another. Jax, Tommy, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Turn your lights off real quick. What do you got? Look on top of that peak right there. What is that? You see that, that I light? See, I see a glow. That's, That's not definitely. a star, man. As we head up the mountain, I notice this really weird light hovering over one of the adjacent peaks. And as I watch it, this thing literally starts to move laterally from left to right. It looks like it's right on top of that mountain peak. I mean, that doesn't look like a star to me. No, it's not a star. It's glowing, though, whatever it is. I have no idea what I'm looking at. It just seems to be hovering and moving back and forth. I've never seen anything like this before. I think an airplane would be moving faster than that. Man. Oh, definitely. I mean, come on, guys. It's definitely not a star. It's definitely not a satellite. It's unlike any phenomenon that I've ever observed. Hey, guys, I'm going to take this path up and see if we can get a better view of what we just saw. Jax is on a mission, bud. There's definitely something weird going on, and we can all sense it. We're moving up the mountain, and personally, I'm feeling pretty nervous. We don't know what we're going to find. Did you guys just hear that? 
thing. Did you hear anything? <sighs> I didn't hear anything! I'm coming down! <sighs> Give me a sec. You all right? Yeah, I'm up there, and I can hear it going my direction to the right. It's somewhere in between us, the noise I heard. I think we head up this path a little bit, see what we can see in between these two ridges before we make our way up this ridge. OK. Wait, let's get this out. How's the radiation, Tommy? 0.08 curies. That's normal. I'm going to do an EMF real quick. OK. Just... Oh, we're getting something. Look at that, man. It's crazy. We're definitely headed in the right direction. Eyes open, eyes open. Hey! What is that? Look! What is that? Hey, look at that. That looks like... Holy Dude, is, is that, that ours? It's ours, look! That's the friggin' box! This thing actually traveled from one area to another, and it's like it found us. Almost like someone was sending us a message. And honestly, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my mind around. We had that crazy weather, and all the instrumentation was going nuts when the drone disappeared, right? That was I mean, about it, two, and, and, two miles from here where we last saw it. I mean, it essentially vanished, guys. Let's be honest. Theoretically, it's been proven that something like a vortex could exist. And perhaps here in the Alaska Triangle, this so-called vortex could be the cause of many of the strange disappearances and airplane crashes. And perhaps it has a little bit of help. We'll never know for sure. With the fate of the military C-54 still unresolved, the team is left to ponder their evidence. They've learned that mining areas, rich in certain metals, can throw off a plane's instrumentation. They also know that jagged mountains and unpredictable weather are conventional reasons a plane might disappear. But could there be more? The team experienced areas of sudden unexplained magnetic fluctuations similar to readings in the Bermuda Triangle. Could this indicate a vortex, an interplanetary door? Is it just coincidence these places have UFO sightings in abundance? Well, this is one for the books. Yes, it is. Let's get out of here. The team will have to do more to find out why so many continue to go missing in Alaska. night in 1987, outside Wrangell St. Elias National Park, a motorist experienced the most frightening moment of his life. A vehicle had veered off the road, its lights blinking, and its front door open. The man stopped to help. But there was no driver, only blood. The man started searching, unaware that there had been four recent sightings in this area of an enormous hairy beast he was about to experience number five. The creature is a local legend known as Hairy Man, far more massive than Bigfoot. To this day, the missing driver has never been found. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. There's something out there. 
three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. So around this bend up here, the team's search begins at the southern edge of the Wrangell St. Elias National Park, where the abandoned car was discovered. The male driver's name will be withheld. What do you guys think? It looks pretty nasty. Wrangell St. Elias became a national park in 1980. Before that, it was known for copper mining. But after this disappearance and other sightings around that time, it's now associated with the Harry Man. Locals are saying there's been five sightings about a mile of location here, wow. from the roadway to about a mile that way. Let's get to it. For Ken, the pursuit of creatures like the hairy man has been a major part of his life's work. He's always known Alaska might provide a huge payoff. It's a vast wilderness area with lots of food, water, trees for coverage, everything that a large primate would need to survive out here. Correct. This area is full of potential for what we're looking for. Because the driver went missing at night, the team will do an overnight hunt to see if anything is stirring here. Can't get more wild than this. To me, this search is personal. My sister once had a sighting near my house, and to this day, she swears it was the Hairy Man. Hairy Man is a legend hundreds of years old and appears related to the worldwide phenomenon known as Bigfoot. While the typical North American version of this alleged creature stands seven to nine feet tall, stories suggest the Alaskan variant is bigger, possibly much bigger. The massive, shaggy beast is believed to have razor-sharp teeth and is very aggressive. Native American and local legends say it defends its territory and even abducts women and children. If there's a variety that's now attacking grown men unprovoked, it's a terrifying shift in the paradigm. What are we looking for, Ken? You're basically looking for anything abnormal, but the obvious things are going to be like footprints. Hey, guys. What you got? Sightings of the hairy man all over the world are always reported in places where you have conifer trees, pine trees. You're talking different cultures. Different and cultures separated by vast distances with almost identical legends about hairy men. There are a couple theories as to why the hairy man may live around conifer trees. One, of course, is that he may rely on those trees for food and nutrition. But the more likely scenario is that he may rely on the evergreen trees for cover, even when other trees are bare. So in a sense, it acts like a year-round camouflage and helps him remain hidden. I think we need to head down to the water, OK? Right. Reports of the hairy man are often centered around water. From a biological standpoint, this makes perfect sense. All living things need water. So we got a little creek here. And moreover, they often use waterways as corridors, traveling from one area to another. This is the creek. This isn't the river we're looking for. We got a crossing right here. Watch out for holes in the ice, like right there. There's a hole right here, right so there. yeah. I'm I made it. You hole. guys can go. Which Follow my steps. steps. Next All right, time. I'm going. So as we're traveling down these meandering creeks towards the river, we're finding that they're all completely frozen over because it's so cold outside. And this is totally disappointing because it's much harder to find any tracks or really any signs of anything else. Right here. Oh, yeah. Whoa. This is crazy. Have you ever seen this before, Tommy? Back home in Southeast, our people intentionally marked in live trees for us to know where we're going. But this is very different from ones that I've seen. Something intelligent placed these here at very determined angles. Are you looking at a warning, maybe, Ken? That's the concern. If a creature made this display of radiating protrusions, it's a message well known in nature. Keep away. From the swell of a blowfish to the flex of a porcupine, the meaning is understood. Some legends say that the hairy man is the guardian of nature. So he's not just protecting himself, but everything around him. 
So it wouldn't take much to trigger a violent attack. My guess is that a local person is putting these sticks up to warn others that this is his hunting area and to back off. I know Tommy says the trail markers don't match what he knows, but he does live a long ways away, and there could be regional differences. Hey, guys. Shh. Turn our lights off and be real quiet. It could have just been a couple pine cones falling. Getting jumpy. Well, it is getting late. We're in a denser forest. Watch your footing. What's this? What do you say? Hey. Hold on. Hold on. Jeez. Look at that. Ken. Wow. Immediately after finding this strange X formation, we find a pile of large stones that are actually stacked together. And what's really remarkable is that these things are massive. I mean, they've got to weigh 30 or 40 pounds apiece. Throughout history, humans have used rock piles as markers for trails or food sources. Native Alaskans called such markers Inukshuk. But stone piles have also been discovered near large Bigfoot-type tracks. If these creatures exist, could they be intelligent enough to use rocks to help each other navigate or find food? I didn't see any of these kind of rocks around, did you? That creek's got small hand-sized rocks, nothing this size. These stones stand out. They don't look like they belong in this environment at all. It looks like something that was at the bottom of a riverbed for over 100 years. Now we're starting to find all the weird things in the same areas. Do you notice that? Yeah. Down in southeast Alaska, I've seen these, and they're on many of the mountaintops. Really? Uh, but they're in more of a half moon pattern. And I, I've been told that that was a place that the shaman would go to. Um, they, they had ways of communicating with other shaman in other villages from kind of like telepathy. What's that? That was not a pine cone. When I heard that second sound, that put me on edge. One thing I know about the Alaska Triangle is that there are bears here and there are wolves, not to mention whoever put that warning marker up in the tree. Let's go see. You guys heard anything? There's over something there. in the woods over here. Is this the river, Tommy? We're definitely at the river. Where is the river bank here? Gravel, gravel bed here. Ken, you think that noise is from over here? Man, I don't know. It was right there in that brush. Hey, hey, Stay hey, alert. it's hey, right alert. here. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's definitely not a coyote or a wolf. When I see the track, my mind is blown. I'm obviously looking at something that's kind of in the shape of a human foot. This is definitely something extremely large, and I've never seen anything like this before. What do you think? Well, I mean, five toes. If five? I'm not mistaken, look here. We have one here, one here, another one there. I mean, the strides aren't that far apart. From there to there, you got three feet. And what I'm seeing is a double-stepping bear, where you see the front foot and then the back foot steps right in front of the front one, making it look like a, it's a, a big human foot. Um, what I don't see are any claw marks, and usually bears have pretty pronounced claw marks in the front. How about a heel turning as it as it steps down? This is pretty soft sediment here. That, you know, moving down like that. What do you think? It is a plantigrade animal, whatever it is, meaning that it's got a flat-footed stepping motion. I don't see as much as what Tom, Tommy's saying here in this one, though. I see more toes and heel. We each had a different idea as to what this footprint was. So we decided to make a plaster mold of it and bring it to an expert for examination. Either way, bear or hairy man, we know we're not safe in these woods. If this is a hairy man footprint, that's a big footprint. The Alaskan Triangle is home to a mystery. Where do the missing people go? Could some be victims of the massive legendary creature known as Hairy Man? Oh, wow. The team has discovered a large footprint in the woods. They hope an expert at the local zoo can provide some answers. Hey, hello. Are you Drew? I am. Drew. Pleasure to meet you. Hi, I'm Ken. Nice to meet Hi, you. I'm Tommy. Man. Nice to meet you. We understand you know a little bit about bears. I do. I've been a bear viewing guide going on 15 years now. 
Well, that's awesome because there's this great legend here in Alaska of this hairy man creature, very similar to Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And we actually found some prints the other night. Tommy's thinking that maybe it could be a bear print. So if you're willing to take a look at what we have, sure. We have a cast that we made, a plaster cast of the actual print itself. Let's see it. What are your thoughts here? Hmm. This toe is odd shaped. It's bigger than you would expect. Having seen a lot of bear tracks and then looking at these plaster casts, there are some unusual characteristics. The shape in general is a little odd. So what are you thinking here? This gap mm -hmm. is kind of leading me to believe that it's actually two paws. When a bear walks, the print left by its front foot often gets overlapped by its back foot. This is called a double step, which can create the illusion of a single, large, Sasquatch-like footprint. The hind print would be right here. The forepaw would go right here, right behind it. In terms of size, uh, it's definitely within the realm of, of being a bear. So everything I'm seeing here leads me to believe it's a bear. Some of the research that I've done indicates that where there are bears, there are not hairy men, and vice versa. And perhaps that's because in some strange way, they're sort of competing for the same ecological niche. Bears are apex predators, top of the food chain. They can be very territorial against other species. They don't want any competition for any of their food supplies, whether it be game, plants, or whatever. If hairy man exists, it's safe to assume that he's gonna be exactly the same way. So I'm wondering if the, the location that we've been focusing our investigation, mm -hmm. then maybe that doesn't bode well for the possibility of a hairy man in that particular area. Right. There were five different sightings within a year of the motorist's disappearance, but that was more than a decade ago. Could bears have driven off a hairy man-type creature? Was the driver taken by a bear? Or did he simply wander off for reasons unknown? the team will have to redirect their search. Well, thank you. Appreciate you coming out and helping us out with this. My yeah. pleasure. Come on in. Hey, Ken. Robert. Hey. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Hoping to identify new leads, Ken goes to meet a local expert, Dr. Robert Alley. Robert is the foremost authority on Alaskan hairy man lore. Let's talk about the, the physical characteristics of the Alaskan hairy man. Well, I've got these forensic illustrations. Sasquatches in Alaska can be 12 foot or even 15 feet. Wow. The first thing that Robert tells me about the Alaskan hairy man, they are huge. Down in the lower 48, the average height is about eight feet. But up here, they've been described as being up to 15 feet tall. I mean, we're talking prehistoric megafauna here. Two and a half million years ago, megafauna ruled the Earth sloths the size of bears, bears the size of elephants. Throughout the Pleistocene, these oversized creatures roamed the Americas freely. They went extinct a mere 12,000 years ago. Some scientists blame their demise on the encroachment of man, but maybe one had enough man in it to survive. They run fast. They also sometimes have speech. Sure. The theft of women and children is attributed to these creatures. Wow. Stories about the hairy man kidnapping children might just be a fable. Kind of like telling your kids about Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf so they don't wander off into the woods alone. But every legend has truth. I mean, a wolf would actually eat a child that wandered into the woods by themselves. That's actually happened. So what if these hairy man legends are based on something that the Alaska natives have actually seen? Where are you in this investigation right now? We, uh, we checked out an area down near uh, Wrangell, St. Elias National Park. You know, a lot of weird stuff happened that mm -hmm. night. There was a pile of these huge rocks that had been stacked up. I mean, these rocks were massive and heavy. I, I don't see how something could have you know, put these together in this particular area. Stone stacking is something that has been attributed to Sasquatches. I have actually found this sort of thing. And Prince of Wales and Revilla Island are two places where I found this. And this is just an example of one of those rocks. The rock that Robert found in Southeast Alaska is very similar to the ones that we found. There's definitely a pattern going on with these rock piles. I wonder if sometimes they're not moved or rearranged as message stones to each other. Would you be OK with me kind of doing a little test on this particular rock? I Absolutely. Just... The more that Robert talks about the communication of the hairy man, the more I wonder if 
maybe there's some significance to these stones. Maybe they contain hidden messages that we can't necessarily see. Some animals are capable of detecting electromagnetic fields, so I'm gonna use my EMF reader to see if I can pick up anything. If it's just a rock, I wouldn't expect to get anything. That's interesting, look at that. Well, another interesting thing see is there's, there's inclusions here that look crystalline like quartz. Look at that, Rob. You get right in there where those crystals are. Yeah, look at that. Wow, this is actually uh, pretty active. Now it's really going crazy, look at that. I'm wondering if these stones actually have more significance than simply being markers. Maybe there's something else here. The search for new hairy man sightings leads Jax to an incredible story about an old town called Portlock. This mining village in the Kenai Peninsula was abandoned in the 30s due to multiple violent encounters with a massive hairy beast. He and Ken arrange a meeting with a man named Moses who claims to have information about the event. How you doing? I'm Jax. Jax. Nice to meet you. OK. Well, you know, we're looking into some interesting stuff with the hairy man. Uh, so we uh, obviously looked into the area of Fort Lock and just uh, want to pick your brain about a few things. My dad, he was raised out in that area back in the 1930s. People started disappearing, hunters going out and not coming back. When they went to go check them out, they found out that they were just mutilated. The hairy man was uh, scaring everybody away, and so everybody moved out. Hearing Moses describe these vicious killings is very disturbing. It indicates a much more violent version of Bigfoot than I've ever experienced. Uh, one time, I, we decided to go check it out. Of course, the village was abandoned, and there was no nothing there. It was real eerie, you know, real quiet and everything like that. Then I heard some noise. Or I turned around and I looked in the woods. I didn't see anything at first, you know. I started smelling something. It was worse than a skunk. And I turned around and I looked. Sure enough, I seen this uh, figure over by the trees. I've never seen uh, somebody that was so muscular, and he was real hairy, you know. His description is sounding very familiar to me. And one aspect is the very foul stench, the horrible odor. I've heard this many times before from eyewitnesses all over the world. The use of foul odors for defense pervades the animal kingdom. From tiny creatures like stink bugs and millipedes, to vicious predators like the wolverine, whose scent marking has earned it the nickname Skunk Bear, it's an effective way to avoid confrontation. Right now, telling it, it raises the hair on the back of my neck. Those are things that we don't talk about, because in our culture, we say that if we talk about it, hairy man will come around. Have you gone back there since then? No, I wouldn't go back, not me. We have a lot of interest in this area, yeah. and that's yeah. obviously why we wanted to talk to yeah. you. Yeah, good luck, you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Moses. Okay. Moses' description of the hairy man is very compelling. But the interesting hidden detail here is that the hairy man was terrorizing a mining town. And Wrangell St. Elias, where the motors disappeared, was also known for mining years ago. I'm thinking there's a connection between these strange rocks that the hairy man's using. We've got to get ourselves to Portlock. Alaska has long been a breeding ground for the biggest animals on the continent. The Alaskan moose is the largest variety of its species. The Kodiak bear is the most massive brown bear in the world. But is there something even bigger? A hairy ape-like monster towering up to 15 feet tall. And could it be contributing to the rash of missing persons in the Alaska Triangle? After learning about brutal killings attributed to Hairy Man at a now abandoned mining town, and the unusual electromagnetic readings on stone piles the creature makes, the team heads toward the Portlock area. I know in Portlock there's, uh, there was a mine there. There's a lot of mining activity, and, and then a cannery. There's all kinds of metal things there that might hmm. have some electromagnetic stuff happening there. This is a great area to really focus our investigation. Portlock, the town, doesn't actually exist anymore. And it's completely inaccessible by car. 
but we feel if we can get as close as we can, we can launch the drone to overfly the area. Getting real close here, guys. Cool. As a folklorist, it's easy to write off a lot of these hairy man stories as the boogeyman, something meant to sound scary with no truth behind it. But Portlock had something real happen, and people left because of it. At this point, it's not folklore anymore, but genuine history. Check this place out. It. Yeah. All right, so you're going to be monitoring the camera, right? Yes. OK, what I'm going to do is, uh, if you can feed me those GPS coordinates, if we do see anything, I'll mark a waypoint, and that way we can track it later on the ground. It's all good to go. Good. The team has a specially modified drone with a range approaching one mile and a battery life of more than half an hour. And the full HD camera will make any anomaly below easy to spot in real time on the team's smartphone. All right, so remember, what we're looking for, guys, is anything that stands out, you know, anything that just seems out of place. What I'm looking at is a lot of just forest is dense. What direction do I need to start heading to get to the township? Well. Just this area you're hovering over now, just around the bend and, and, and around the edge of the bay is the head of the river. Huh? And uh -huh. That's the place, the river that people have gone missing. Let's follow that for a second. It's like it's frozen in parts, huh? Yeah, it is, definite. Yeah. All right, working our way west. Terrain's changing again. Yeah, there's lots of trees. And... Whoa, 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 whoa. What was that? Let me come back around. Go back, go back. Rock stack right there? That could definitely be a rock pile. And let's get a GPS coordinate right on it. Suddenly, our drone spots an anomaly, a stone pile similar to the one that we found on our initial investigation. Are the, those are the coordinates right there? Yeah. OK, got it. Yeah. Man, I, I definitely want to get to that spot. We got to figure out how to get there. Once again, a hairy man area appears to have a rock formation. The question is, why? We've now seen these where a driver went missing and where an entire village was terrorized. Could these stone piles have a connection to the hairy man's aggressive and violent behavior? And is that related to the high electromagnetic fields they share? We need to take a ride out there. Yeah. Can we get a helicopter? I mean, yeah. is that something that That's we could? That's what we're going to have to do, right, Tommy? Otherwise, it's a four-hour boat ride out there and a four-hour ride back. I'm up for air travel, you? Yeah. Yeah, we don't have time for that. We got to right. get there ASAP. The other mystery that I'm hoping that these rock piles will shed some light on is, how is it that the hairy man and his kind are so elusive? Among researchers, it's believed that if a Bigfoot-like species exists, they must be very few in number, but highly mobile. Researchers in the lower 48 have shown patterns of Bigfoot sightings in different areas at different times of the year, suggesting they migrate, possibly following seasonal food supplies. Could these rock piles somehow be a crucial key to how these creatures navigate and stay hidden? So I'm anxious to get a port lock. This is going to be really cool. All right, guys, look, we're here. Limited daylight by the time we get down there. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, Andy. You guys all ready to go? Yeah. Yes, sir. We're ready to do this. Thanks for uh, giving us a ride. You bet. The team is being taken by Chopper to the site where Portlock used to be, and they'll be dropped off for the night. The Chopper will have to return to base and pick them up in the morning. This is hairy man country down here. They're always found in areas where there are a lot of pine trees, very green and rich. Going into this remote area is a little intimidating. I've heard stories of hairy man tracks meeting up with moose tracks and only hairy man tracks leaving. Anything that could kill a moose and carry it off would have no trouble tearing apart a man. Basically, the land, let's get through the coordinates, find a good place, you know, a safe place, really, tonight for us to set up camp. As we're flying over Portlock, I'm noticing how dense the terrain is. I'm looking at where a village used to be and how nature's taking it back. This is an excellent opportunity for something that does not want to be found to hide and thrive. You can't get over the fact that this entire village was abandoned. Their mutilated bodies washed down into the river river up above, that was, that was definitely scary stuff. Now 
we have to find our way to the stone pile that we saw from the drone. We have no idea how this thing got here. I mean, no one's inhabited this area for almost 80 years. We're gonna have to work our way through some dense forest into a potentially dangerous situation. And we're gonna have to do it on our own. We're about 300 yards away from the stone pile. Is that what you got on the GPS? Yeah, check it out. Here we are, so about 300 yards due southeast. In the woods near Portlock, the team treks toward the site of a possible stone pile they spotted with their drone. You guys all right? No. You OK, Ken? Yeah, I'm just getting hung up here. Guys, you're going to have to hunker down low to get through this. Yeah. Watch your eyes. Hey, guys. Over here, I think we got it. There's some rocks here, guys. These are massive stones. It's frozen right into the ground here, ice right here. I'm interested to see what this meter has to say, Ken. Absolutely. Ken uses his EMF reader to see if these rocks, like the one Robert Alley has, show any electromagnetic properties. It's just redlining. Let me That's see it on this side. Okay. Oh, guys, look at this. Definitely getting a hit in here. So maybe there's something inside the rocks. These lighter ones, they, they all look like river rocks to me. Exactly. The first thing I saw them, they look like they belong on a riverbed. So it's not like a quartz or anything like that. I've got a Just magnet. A... Hold on. See that? It's not real strong, but it's enough to hold it there. There's a magnetic field that's kind of sticking on there a little bit. One interesting theory that Robert suggests is that the hairy man may be attracted to stones that possess geomagnetic properties. It's known that some animals use magnetic fields for navigation, and it's also known that the hairy man's elusiveness is legendary. Maybe there's a connection. Maybe these rock piles guide the hairy man to safe hiding spots. And if this is a safe spot, what happens to a native population if they build a village nearby? Could it have reacted violently, and that's the root of the legends? And could the motorist have also traveled into one of these safe spots? It's all very interesting. Yeah, let's keep looking. Hear something? Hey, let's get down right here. Wait, yeah. <laughs> Thought I heard a noise up ahead. Almost just kind of had that feeling like I was being watched. If there are bears in the area, they do stay around the perimeter. And from what I'm hearing with the hairy man, they kind of do the same thing. You guys ready to keep moving? Yeah. Jax! Got a break on a tree over there. That's totally bent down. There's another branch snapped off right here. Well, that's unusual. What is that, maybe seven feet? Huh. What we need to look for is more of these in a line. Let's keep looking. Ken, look up there. That's a fresh one right there. Another one right here. Look at this. Look, it's on the ground. That's just been ripped off. This is very suspicious. There's definitely no claw marks on this tree. It could be marking its territory. This could be mm -hmm. like a boundary. I'm not a wildlife expert, but I know a lot of animals spend time in trees and hanging from branches, and that can explain a lot of the broken limbs. But given everything else, you can at least say that it's odd. Let's check low, too, Ken. Gotcha. More branches broke right over here on this hey, tree. Ken, let's go look over here. Yeah, that's been twisted around right there and broken here. You smell something? I smell it. It's like trash, but worse. It's kind of rank. Not good at all. It's picking up over here, guys. That's really getting pungent. It's getting, oh, that is awful. <sighs> Hey, this is a nest. This looks like a big nest. So we find this structure in the woods, a very rudimentary shelter. And it's reminiscent of the shelters allegedly built by the Ohio Grassman, which is a Bigfoot variant. Perhaps this is a trait of the Alaskan hairy man, too. To me, this looks like a man-made survival shelter that's been abandoned. The 
problem is that this area is extremely remote. It would have to be somebody that's out here by themselves, living in isolation, and pretty much lost it. So it's some dude with major issues, but it's still a man and not a monster. This was obviously laid here. I mean, this is a natural fall, but all of this There's grass. There's more of it way back there. Way back there. See all the way to your left? That's like an organ or something. That's meat. There's organs. Not a lot of blood. <laughs> That's fresh meat, it's not rotting. Whatever left that meat might be around still. In the Alaska Triangle, sightings of a Bigfoot-like creature called Hairy Man have coincided with reports of missing people. The team has uncovered several recurring patterns in these areas. There's some rocks here, guys. Stone piles. It's just redlining. Whoa. Limb formations in trees. Something intelligent placed these here. And now, a telltale smell. Ah, oh, this is getting putrid. In 2012, camper Alex Blaswell smelled something frighteningly similar in Denali Park. I went camping with my buddy a couple years ago. We were just drinking beers and playing cards. After a while, I needed to use the restroom. So I stepped outside, and there's like this putrid smell in the air. I went out into the woods. Then I heard something. So I shined my light out, and I saw something. At first, I thought maybe it was a bear, but it was definitely standing on two feet. I turned around and ran back to the tent. When I got there, I was so freaked out, my buddy didn't understand anything I was saying. I turned off the lantern, and me and my buddy just sat in the dark for the rest of the night, staring into the woods. What is that? It's like a big nest. That's meat, there's organs. There's not a lot of blood. Whatever put that meat in there is going to come back for it. The best possible thing is for us to set up the trail cam, and I'd say let's go set up a camp somewhere far away from here. It's worth a shot. The team will use modified trail cameras to monitor the site. The infrared video will stream as a live feed to their tablet computer. Bears usually bury their food. And they don't just leave it on top there. I've never seen anything like that before, have you? Me neither. This is, this is highly odd. I say let's set the other trail cam up at the rocks. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, let's get moving. We need to set up two trail cams, one at the den and one at the stone stack, so we can get a safe distance away to observe it from our monitors. Who's got the other camera? I've got uh, it. I think Tommy's got it. Let's look for a good tree. You guys got it? We got it. I'll keep a lookout. Come on, guys, let's hustle. All right. I think we're at the right angle there, right? Is it yeah. on? It's Maybe on. Right over there. Let's get out of here. We've decided to set up a camp. We're going to listen, we're going to watch, and if we're just lucky enough, maybe we'll get something. So we're looking for a level spot to set up tent? Yeah, somewhere far away. Guys, I think we need to head to high ground. Hey, hey, up here. I like it. This is perfect. We got coverage from behind. We're going to hear anything that tries to come up behind us. Lots of brush back there. Exactly. We got a good view of the valley below. We're not wide out in the open. Let's get the tent up. Want to get to it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's see what this works. All right, what we're looking at is camera one. Camera two is the rock pile. Surveillance can be painful, but this is probably our best bet. You guys keep an eye on that. I've got my night vision monocular. I'm just going to scan the woods around us. You see pretty good with that? A little bit, but these woods are so dense. One part about surveillance is sometimes it's a whole lot of nothing. Camera one at the den, no changes, and camera two, nothing at the rocks. Just a waiting game, huh? Wait and see. I'm going to try something a little bit different. I think I'm going to get the call blaster about We've got some special sounds that I downloaded onto the hard drive.
What do we have there? A small animal in distress. Any prey animal is going to act on that. I mean, it's just an instinct. Do you have the thermal imaging? I really think that's the best way to tell if there's anything moving around out there. Did you hear that? Yeah. No. Something out there. Towards the left, back where the rocks are. That was at the stone pile? Listen. Yeah. What the hell was that? Jax, get the gun. Get the gun. Where's it at? There it is. Where's the trail cam? Where is it? I don't see it. It's gone? It's not here. Wait. Wait, wait, it's right here. Tommy. Yeah. Camera's down. Are you guys sure you had it securely on this tree? It was on tight. We've got something. Look for tracks, look for hairs, any sign that anything was in this area. I know we attached a camera securely to the tree, but I still think it might have just fallen. I'm not discounting other possibilities, but you have to start with the most plausible explanation. I don't know what's up with that camera. It was very tightly attached. You know, they're supposed to be out there for weeks, even months. Sometimes legends are just legends, but I'm thinking maybe there's more to this one. Let's take a look at these rocks. Those have definitely been moved. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. OK, give me some light over this area here. Oh, right here. Huh. That's a heel there. There, it's indented. It's twice the length of my hand. Put your foot down there, Jax. How big is that? Wow. It's definitely bigger than your foot, man. I definitely want to see what we got on the camera. I mean, that could be the uh, clincher. Let's go get the other trail cam first. Oh, smells awful. Like, awful, man. Oh, God. Well, it looks the same. Where's the camera? It's there. It's still there. The camera's there. What do you think? We grab the camera grab and go? Grab the camera. We need to get back to the tent. What do you think? I agree. Order stuff and see what we got. Let's get out of here, guys. This is camera one. Camera one. This is the den, right? Yes. It's not showing anything on camera one. Get the SD card for the other one. All right, here's the second camera. Oh, what was that? Let's rewind it. Hold rewind. on. Rewind. All right, here we go. Ready? Oh, oh. just a shadow. I yeah. didn't see anything. Something walking across. Can you pause that? Here we go. Pause it. That's the best I can do. Just a big shadow. Can't oh, tell what it is. No. Something large, obviously. Whatever it was, it's gone now. It's hard to be that close and knowing we're close to something. Truth be told, the Harry Man mystery has been going on for centuries. Many, many people, including myself, have tried to find it and never have. Why haven't we found a body? You know, where do they go? The possibility of the Harry Man existing is just too strong to be ignored. I mean, when you look at the incredible number of sightings and the sheer consistency of the descriptions, 
Just maybe these stone piles have a way of helping it avoid detection. And that leaves us grasping at shadows. It remains an enigma. For now, the most infamous beast of them all remains the most elusive. But is it because Hairy Man is a mere fabrication? Some combination of animals in the brush, wind in the trees, and overactive witness imaginations. We looked at each other, and that's the first time I've ever been that scared. Or is it possible this hairy man uses navigational abilities to hide and overpowering strength to defend its turf? Because unlike its victims, it actually wants to stay missing in Alaska. In 2005, mountain climber Darren Markham was descending from a successful summiting of Mount Hayes in Alaska. As he worked his way toward base camp in the dark, the rocks suddenly flashed green around him. He looked up and saw an egg-shaped orb glowing in the sky above. It hovered a moment, then rocketed skyward out of sight. When Markham arrived at base camp, his partner, Sidney Yanovich, who was supposed to be waiting there for him, was gone. His equipment was left behind, but footprints were not. He had simply vanished, and he's never been seen again. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. Pretty technical climb, isn't it, Tommy? Yeah, it's not one of the tallest mountains here in Alaska, but it's, it's definitely a steep one. The team begins their trek to the base camp where the mountain climber went missing to see what evidence they can gather for their investigation. They know it will be a treacherous journey. Mount Hayes is just under 14,000 feet tall. It's the tallest peak in the eastern Alaska range, and it has a rise of 8,000 feet in just two miles. So it's dangerous. And that's before we consider the fact that it's in the Alaska Triangle. The Alaska Triangle is one of the iconic mysteries of the modern world. There are so many people that go missing here, even today, that it demands a search for answers. As someone who's pursued strange phenomena around the world, I've long been drawn to this area to see if there's more to it than meets the eye. It's a nice look out up here, guys. Check out that view. Incredible out here. Wow. Nothing but blue ice. As an investigator and former police officer, I'm always drawn to a good mystery. But for me, the exploration of the Alaska Triangle will be all about the evidence. What can we find, and what will that prove about the huge number of people that go missing here? Watch your step. Oh. It's 
Yeah, slow and easy. Hard to see where we're going here. For me, exploring the Alaska Triangle is personal. My father went missing when I was young, and it's always had me wondering, what is it about this place that causes so many disappearances? When I came across Ken and Jax, who shared my curiosity, it seemed like a perfect opportunity to form a team and see what we could find. As night begins to fall, the team knows temperatures can easily plummet to 40 below on this mountain. But based on the story of the missing hiker and historical UFO trends, night is the optimal time to scan the skies for anomalies. UFOs are a pretty common phenomenon. I mean, you're talking about thousands and thousands of documented sightings around the world. There are a lot of people that will point to, like, the ancient civilizations and uh, the way they talk about gods that come down from the skies. Since the dawn of time, man has looked to the heavens with both awe and dread. Comets and meteors inspired legends of angry gods flinging fiery swords. But even as astronomers began to decipher the motion of celestial bodies in the 1500s, artwork continued to show strange and frightening lights in the sky. Considering man has only been airborne since 1903, when the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, what could those other visions be? Famed astronomer Carl Sagan said, it would be astonishing if there weren't extraterrestrial intelligence in our universe. I mean, what's your thought on it? There's a lot of these sightings being government test vehicles and concept vehicles and things like that. Alaska has nine different military bases, including Fort Greeley, which is right next to Mount Hayes. We're talking test flights and missile launches and activity at all hours. This could explain any strange sightings in the area. A large percentage of UFO sightings are probably experimental, top secret things, but there's always that small percentage that are completely unexplainable. The fact that experimental military craft accounts for so many so-called UFO sightings speaks to a larger fear. What if UFOs are, in fact, alien military? They may view us as enemies to destroy or mere ants to crush on their march through the cosmos. This is it. We're really here. Well, this is an excellent place to build a base camp. Because of the rock shelter here, then it's a flat area. You know, one of my thoughts was maybe Sydney fell in a crevice, an avalanche or something, covering them up. Well, glaciers do have crevasses everywhere around them, so maybe we should look around. In Alaskan lore, mountains and glaciers are often seen as living things because of how active and dangerous they are. They constantly evolve and can swallow somebody whole in a heartbeat. I don't see any right out here, the solid ice that we're standing on. Sydney's fellow climber found all the equipment. None of it was disturbed. Just getting to the base camp made it clear how experienced you need to be to scale this mountain. So the idea of an accomplished climber like Sydney wandering off without his equipment doesn't make any sense to me. I'm taking some readings. The first thing I have is the Geiger counter. At alleged locations where UFOs have landed, people have detected radioactive contamination. If UFOs really are crossing interstellar space, that would require some type of tremendous energy supply that would obviously leave some kind of residue behind. Anything? Hold on. I got nothing. There are theories that UFOs, whatever they are, are using the magnetic energy of the planet as a form of propulsion, something that's way beyond our technology. It's interesting. Using magnetism for travel has found early success in Asia and Europe, where magnetic levitation trains, known as maglevs, are part of daily life. But maglevs operate at a fixed height, just a few inches above their tracks. A more recent technology, known as quantum locking, is just being explored in the lab. It allows an object to suspend itself at variable heights. Quantum locking occurs when a Type II superconductor encounters a magnetic field. Most of the field lines are repelled around its perimeter, but a select few are funneled in and out, locking it into place and negating gravity. Could an advanced alien race be manipulating Earth's magnetic field in order to traverse our skies? This is a magnetometer, and holy crap. Oh. Why is the line all the way to the end? Exactly. I've never seen it like that. You guys, are you guys seeing this? Completely spiked. Totally. It's, it's totally peaked. It means that we're getting some type of immense magnetic energy 
Hold on, let me make sure there's not something going on here. Guys, I've never seen it like that. Whoa, look, look. Whoa, whoa. It's, it's dropping. dropping. It... Drastically dropping. Holy crap. Holy... All the way down. It's gone from one end of the spectrum to the other. This is, this is really weird. I think we should find an expert on this right away. Let's get out of here. The team's strange experience leaves them with some questions, but not as many as Private Matt Schaefer had in this same area just three years ago. Back when I was in the reserves, I took a night flight out to Fort Greeley, which is right next to Mount Hayes. The weather was cold but tame. It was a typical flight I took numerous times before. But this night, our helicopter got hit by a sudden jolt. The pilot didn't seem to know what was going on. Then we got hit by an even bigger jolt. It felt like a giant hand shoved the chopper to the side. My sergeant pointed at this bright light outside the window. I couldn't take my eyes off it. A craft emerged from the light. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Definitely not military. It hovered by our chopper for a minute and then raced away. To this day, I have no idea what the craft was or where it came from. Based on their strange experience at the Mount Hayes base camp, the team schedules a meeting with the director of the Alaskan chapter of MUFON, which stands for the Mutual UFO Network. Brent Mitchell Godet has been investigating alien phenomenon around the globe since the 1970s. If anybody can help us with this case, it's him. So the other night, the three of us were out on Mount Hayes. We were investigating an area where a climber had gone missing. And his fellow climber had seen strange lights in the sky right beforehand. Do you know a lot about the Mount Hayes area? I would say that Mount Hayes has a lot of questionable things going on. Back in the 1960s, a operative reported that there was an underground, in the mountain, UFO base on Mount Hayes. The Alaska Triangle has one of the highest rates of UFO sightings per capita in the country. Alaska also leads the U.S. with the highest rate of missing persons, at more than 3,000 per year. Is there a connection? Could there be intelligent life coming to our planet and taking people for unknown reasons? As our team investigates the mysterious disappearance of a climber on Mount Hayes, they uncover a stunning claim. A operative reported that there was an underground, in the mountain, UFO base on Mount Hayes an alien base, is that what we're saying here in Alaska? Yes. Back in the 1960s, the United States government started a program with remote viewing. Remote viewing is a psychic endeavor where a viewer attempts to discern distant events through extrasensory perception. It's a phenomenon that the US government took seriously for more than two decades. In one experiment, famed psychic Pat Price earned credibility when he accurately drew a sketch of a unique gantry crane in use at a Russian military base. But Price also made other, even more incredible claims. What Pat Price reported is that the UFO base in Mount Hayes he saw as being a training base and a supply base. Guys, this is huge. Rent's claim about an underground alien base on Mount Hayes might explain what happened to us the other night. When we experienced that magnetic spike that slowly faded, maybe that was something beneath us that was retreating into the mountain. This makes me think about those legends of glaciers being alive and swallowing people. Maybe they're alive in, in ways that the natives didn't realize. For me, the idea of this underground base raises way more questions than it answers. It's an interesting idea, but I'm not even sure how we can investigate that claim. What would be a tool for us to be able to help in this investigation. More and more people are disappearing here in Alaska and attributing it to UFO abduction. Abductees that have actually been returned believe that they can and have communicated with the people that abducted them. They communicate on a telepathic level, so 
If you can get somebody that has been abducted and is willing to work with you, give it a shot. Telepathic communicator and then somebody that can pass maybe information on to us. Exactly. Brett's idea might seem unorthodox, but if the US government can use telepathy and remote viewing and have success with it, maybe it's worth a shot to find an abductee to see if it can work for us. If alien abductions are happening today, it could be the continuation of an ancient phenomenon. Cave drawings of alien-like beings suggest such encounters have gone on for centuries. Modern abduction claims surged in the 1950s during the beginning of the space age. Many psychologists concluded that abductees were simply having false memories based on images from the news or space age fiction. But could it be that our own advancement finally justified abductees' experiences and encouraged them to talk. Could the missing hiker and others in the Alaska Triangle be victims of aliens? Connecting. I found a man named Wilbur Allen on the web who claims to have been abducted multiple times. He's captured thousands of images of aerial anomalies that seem to show up wherever he goes. This seems to give his story a lot of credibility. So we were told that you were the guy we need to talk to about aliens and alien abduction. Well, for me, it started when I was five. I went to my room, I went to bed, and my parents put me to sleep. My bedroom door burst open, and in walked five very small, gray extraterrestrials in silver spaces. They communicated to me telepathically. As they communicated to me, I blacked out. After that, I started having a series of close encounters. We would like to invite you to come up here and help us out with this investigation. We feel that with your experience with abduction and your abilities to basically communicate with these beings, that that's going to give us the best chance to hopefully experience something ourselves. Love definitely comes, so see you in Mount Hayes, Alaska. We figure there's no downside in bringing Wilbur aboard. If there's even a remote chance that he's been abducted and can actually attract UFOs, then that's exactly what we need for this investigation. It looks like it's time to plan our Mount Hayes stakeout. I'm on it. This is the spot. Yeah. Well, we got a good view of Mount Hayes, right? Yeah, we do. Jax and I are out placing cameras in several locations, all pointed towards Mount Hayes. Tonight, we're doing a stakeout at base camp, and we're taking Wilbur with us. We're giving him a chance to work his magic and see if we can document any UFO activity. The team will watch the skies using modified trail cameras that are high speed, infrared, and motion activated. If anything moves in the dark, these cameras will catch it. All right, we're all good on that one. We we'll move to the next spot. Yeah. Is that him? It's our guy. Wilbur, you got a good view up there. Hey How guys, Jax. Jax, good to nice meet you, meet sir. You. It's Tommy and Ken. Hi, I'm Tommy. Tommy. Can you meet you in person, Wilbur? Good to meet you, sir. And this is a pretty bizarre case. Allegations of UFOs and abduction. This is right up your alley, right? Right up my alley. All right. I'm very skeptical of Wilbur's claims, as anyone should be. It's been shown in many of these supposed abductees they're suppressing trauma from something earlier in their life. I don't know if this is true for Wilbur, but it is something to keep in mind. Let's get up there before it gets too dark. The team begins their hike to the Mount Hayes base camp, where Darren Markham realized his partner Sidney had disappeared. They hope to capture images of any airborne objects, and if they're UFOs, try to confirm if they're coming into or out of Mount Hayes. Do you have any crampons? It gets real slippery out here on the glacier. I got them. When we get to base camp, we're going to set up the stakeout. Hopefully, Wilbur's presence will draw the UFO to us. First, he's going to set up his high-speed camera and try to capture an image that way. Between that and the specialty cameras that we set up earlier today, we're going to try to gather some evidence about this mystery. This is as far we can go. We need to tether up before we go any further. I agree. Okay, we gotta get this rope around us. I 
I have that feeling like I'm being monitored. It's like they're letting me know they're here. Now describe that feeling for it's, us. It's though. inside. It's like this feeling I'm getting. This voice is saying they're here. They're here. The wild, unexplored terrain of Alaska is responsible for more missing people per capita than any other state in the U.S. It's also home to a tremendous number of UFO sightings. Is there a connection? A recent mapping of UFO sightings and reports of missing persons shows a striking correlation. And Alaskan resident Jerry Wilcox believes he was almost one of those statistics. I live in an isolated area. It takes a long time to get home. I remember on that night, I was extremely tired. So I had my radio up louder than usual, and it made an odd noise. And I looked down for just a second, and then when I looked back up, there was a guy right in the middle of the road. Slam on my brakes, and when I stop, he's not there. And I looked in my rearview mirror, and there he was about 30 feet behind me. Just this eerie black figure. And this bright light overhead goes on, and I find myself getting out of my car. I'm not even consciously wanting to, it just sort of happened. I look up at this ship hovering above. This thing wasn't making a sound, not moving. I was glued to that light. And the next thing I do remember, I heard a wolf howling. And that snapped me out of whatever it was. And I got in my truck and I got out of there. I expected whatever it was to follow me but I didn't see the light again. I have that feeling like I'm being monitored. They're here. The team is climbing Mount Hayes to investigate the strange disappearance of a climber. The area has become notorious for unexplained sightings of moving lights in the sky. And some claim that a UFO base exists inside the mountain. Let's keep moving. T right, Wilbur, we have a crevasse right here to the left, man. Let's keep it up, guys. We're almost there. Hey, Tommy, hold up. Check this out. Everything out here is shifted. Ken, get up here. Look at that. It opened right up. Woo. Yeah, this is shifting, man. This is not cool. This is an unstable platform. It's looking like we need to head that direction. Right over here? Yeah, to our 3 o'clock there. Check out these cracks, man. That wasn't like that last night. Here it is, guys. Whoa, what is that? This is absolutely bizarre. That is weird, isn't it? It looks like a face or something. We arrive at the base camp, and there's a strange formation that wasn't there last time. It's a shape in the rock that looks like eyes staring at us. It's really freaky. And you wonder, you know, when the native people talk about glaciers that open up and come after people, is this what they're talking about? Is it completely natural? Or is there something a little more sinister? I'm getting a really strange feeling about all of this. I'm not sure what this formation is or how it got here, but we've seen a lot of shifts in the landscape on our way up. So I've got to think it's just a product of that movement. Well, let's talk about this photographic process. So what are we trying to achieve here? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to program this camera to take a photograph every second. OK. I programmed it for four hours. So we're going to do a four-hour continuous scan of the skies. I've got over 6,000 photographs, all showing cylinders, spheres, objects which fly through at super fast speeds, just a series of objects which are not consistent with anything man-made. 
Listen, I think tonight's gonna be a long night. We need to stay sharp, right? Right. So I'm thinking we break off into shifts. Hey, we'll do the first. All right, that'll work. Just like doing a standard surveillance, this is a very long and tedious process. I'm not convinced that Wilbur has any alien connections, but it is good having an extra man up here. This way we can pair up and have a buddy system to keep each other alert. over there. What's going on out there? Jax, Tommy, did you hear that? The noise that we heard was a deep, rumbling boom mixed with a high-pitched whiz. It definitely doesn't sound like anything you'd hear in nature. You know, we're close to a military base up here. Could have been something from there. It's that? hard to say because it was an abstract sound. I'd never heard anything like that before. Well, you know, something hit, hit and mock. It makes a loud boom noise. Like a sonic boom? Is that sonic what you boom. think? I don't know. Well, it could have been. I don't know. You guys ready for a shift change? Yeah, I'm ready, man. Yeah, definitely, man. All right, well, you guys cool. go catch some winks. Check out the camera over here. Hey, look at that. A white ball of light over Mount Hayes. Holy <laughs> Holy cow. The light over Mount Hayes isn't moving normally. It's changing directions abruptly, going from slow to fast in a blink of an eye. I don't know what to make of it. Wow. What is that? As far back as the 16th century, Native Americans are known to have believed in extraterrestrials. The Hopi Indians of Arizona even claimed that a race of alien-like beings known as ant people lived underground. Could Alaska be home for such a hidden race? And could Mount Hayes be their primary portal into our world? Hey, look at that. Wow. What is that? Is that an airplane? It can't be. It's gone. It went behind Mount Hayes, man. That was weird. Was it an airplane? It's hard to say. I no, don't think so. No, no, man. That was moving too fast. Way too fast. I don't know. What about a concept aircraft? They could be uh, testing something possibly, out here. Possibly, The camera. Maybe we got it on the camera. Wilbur has a still camera that could give us a very clear image of the object. We also have the cameras that Jax and Tommy mounted earlier. Those cameras shoot video, which would allow us to analyze its movements. I agree. We need to take a look at it. Well, should we grab the cameras and go check it out? Yeah, let's do that. We've been on the mountain for hours, and we have one sighting. We want to see if there's any way to track this thing right away. So we hurry down the mountain as quickly as possible. I hope we caught video of this object so we can clarify what it is, because the path that it was on did not seem natural. I'm kind of at a loss of what we're dealing with. Oh, man. Look at that. Oh, man. Right in the lens is there. In the lens. Nothing on the indicator. Nothing at all. Looks like that lens is all iced up. Well, hopefully we have better luck on the next ones here. In Indian investigation, I have in the back of my mind that a camera or two might fail. But in this case, with Mount Hayes, which is a whole lot of landmass to cover, a camera or two going down is not good. The light going over Mount Hayes was moving too fast to really see what it was. Hopefully, some of these cameras work so we can get a good look at it. <sighs> oh, man, it's good. Still here. <sighs> All right, looks like everything worked. Still got battery. Hopefully the other ones are that lucky, huh? Yeah, good deal. As with most UFO sightings, the unusual movement of the object is what made it look like it was not man-made. That was also the case for Becca Daniels on a winter's night in Fairbanks. I was doing dishes after dinner, and I was talking to my girlfriend on the phone. She just lives right in the neighborhood, and she called me to let me know the northern lights were out. So I peeked out my window, and I saw them, and they were really pretty. Then my daughter wanted to go outside to see the northern lights. So we went outside and looked at the lights, and they were incredible that night. 
just spectacular. But then suddenly there were these red lights streaking across the sky and they started forming this circle. And then they were just gone, disappeared. I don't think I've ever seen a helicopter or an airplane in my life do that. And the only word I could use to describe this experience is UFO. You find something exciting for us, Wilbur? I certainly did. This camera is designed to take a photograph every second. And that the camera's shutter speed is set to 1 50th of a second. I did it at a higher shutter speed to avoid blurring, so there is no blurring associated to this. I want you guys to take a look at this. And here's our object. Oh, wow. But this is what we captured as, as the thing flew by. But I want to see what's on our trail cams that we set up. Yeah. yeah let's take a look. Fast forward a little bit. All right, slow down here. Whoa. Whoa. Look at that. They caught it. That's crazy. Ah, oh, look at that. Just back it up. up. Looks like it just went right back behind Mount Hayes. Here, this is camera three. The specialized cameras have captured multiple angles of an airborne object. It has hovering capabilities like a helicopter but can also reverse direction instantly, unlike any known aircraft. It also shows no ramping up speed when moving from a standstill. And based on its position relative to the mountain, the team calculates its drop speed at the end at just over Mach 1. So that's pretty compelling. I think we should probably start mapping some of this stuff out, guys. And this is where camera one is, right, Tommy? Yeah. This first one went down and got iced over, so it doesn't help us at all. Can you flip to the other camera? Camera two, which is the one we had a lot of visibility off that shot. Mm -hmm. And there's the line of sight right there. All right. Camera three was the last one we set up, Tommy. The time stamp on that camera was perfect. Camera four went down, so it's no good to us. And the final cam is the one we all set up at the base. Camera. Right, base camera. All right. Yeah. And that line all coincides right, right here right, yeah. to this X, this spot. After determining the angle and location of all of our strategically placed cameras, we were able to get a pretty good beat on the area where the UFO was actually hovering. We need to go there and see if we can find any kind of evidence. Well, I think we need to go that way. We got to get that drone launched. We're running out of daylight. The team is hiking near Mount Hayes after witnessing a UFO alien or otherwise, and triangulating its position. They are planning to send a drone to look for further evidence. Having Wilbur on our stakeout did exactly what we had hoped. It gave us a sighting. Now we're headed out on our own to pursue it and see if it pans out. Yeah, this is perfect, man. We should be able to get the drone to that spot from right here. So check it out. We're here over that ridge is our spot of interest. Let's get it up. This modified quadcopter has a range approaching one mile with a battery life of more than half an hour. And the full HD camera will make any anomaly below easy to spot in real time on the team's smartphone. You seeing anything yet? No, I'm not seeing anything. Hey, what's that coming up? Where? It's strange in the snow there. Right in the clearing. Right in the clearing there. Go lower. Hold on. Coming down. Whoa. Whoa. It looks pretty big. Look at the edges. Look at how sharp those are. That's not a natural formation, That's man. just weird. I've never seen anything like that. And that's right, pretty much right over our point of interest. You know what this is reminding me of? What's that? Crop circles. I mean, that looks just like a crop circle. Crop circles have been an acknowledged mystery for centuries. A famous pamphlet from the 1600s called The Mowing Devil is one of the earliest references to this bizarre phenomenon. Though this circle was attributed to a spiteful demon, crop circles came into modern consciousness in the 1970s in England 
where large repeating patterns, almost always involving circles, began appearing in grassy fields and then in snowy ones. Two men would later claim to have started the trend as a prank. But detractors believe the intricacy and speed with which some of these patterns appear lies beyond human capabilities. I wish you could get a little closer. I want to see if there are any other markings around that. That's as close as I can get without losing it. It's too windy. Hold on, I got to lock in the GPS coordinates. I'm right above it right now, so lock it in right here. I got it and locked. All right. Finding this marking in the snow is intriguing. We're going to follow the GPS coordinates to the location, see if we can find any more clues to the mystery. Oh, it's up to the right. It's up there, shining light over there. Is that it? I don't know. I can't see. It's shining a light over there. That's it. Oh. Yes, check this out. Don't step in it. Oh, my god. <clears throat> that was like a perfect egg shape. As we get closer to the snow indentation, we notice that it's oval shape instead of round. It reminds me of the ovoid shape. The ovoid is a shape used in Northwest Coast native art, representing new life. Are we about to find new life? Alien life here in the Alaska Triangle? Let's measure it. All right, brother, here. What do you got? It's 22 feet exactly. Holy crap. OK, let's walk around the middle. OK, got gotcha. you. I'll just rotate. The precise regularity of this shape definitely suggests some type of intelligent force behind it. It's like 15 feet, 6 inches. 15 and a half by 22. But whether it has to do with UFOs or a hidden alien base below, will require a lot more evidence. I'm thinking about those crazy readings we got up on the mountain at the base camp. We got that weird magnetic spike. The best evidence we've gotten for the UFO base in the mountain was when the magnetic reading at the base camp started dropping, as if something was retreating into the Earth. A similar reading here could really bolster that theory. What do you got there, Ken? All right, we're right about zero. You guys seeing this? It's zeroed out. No change, still at zero. The magnetometer isn't giving us anything, but that doesn't eliminate the theory in my mind. It could mean that whatever was here is long gone by now. The next thing I would want to do is take some readings of the radioactive content of this circle. Let me get the Geiger counter out. It's going up. It's rising. 21.6, 28. There is some radioactive contamination in this area. That's what it's showing. OK, it's going back down. 21, 18, normal, normal. OK, I think we're getting unhealthy levels there. Definitely. We're actually getting intensified readings of radiation, and that's pretty unsettling. I mean, you don't want to be near something that's giving off radioactive energy. Let's get a sample. We can take it back to get analyzed. We've got photos. We've documented it as best as possible. It's obviously getting unhealthy with the readings there. Yeah, I don't want to be around radioactive contamination. I don't even know if I want to be touching this. Yeah, don't put your fingers in there. I suggest we get a sample maybe a few feet behind you as well for comparison purposes. UFOs have often been linked to radiation, so we think this could be an important piece of physical evidence that a UFO was actually in this particular location. We got it? We got it. Let's go. Let's go. Could these samples be definitive proof that UFOs exist? The radioactive levels were pretty frightening. That's like getting a third body part kind of scary. This could be pretty hardcore definitive evidence. We're on our way to meet Jim Anderson at the Earth Sciences Lab. We gave him the snow samples from the possible UFO landing site, and we're hoping he can tell us whether there's anything unusual about them. Good to see you again, Jim. Hey, good to see you. Hello. Well, what have you got for us? Eagerly awaiting this. I got your samples. I tested it with an ohm meter and tested its electrical resistance. And what I found was your control samples, completely normal in every way. That was very similar to tap water, but sample number two very unusual. It tests out at 50 parts per million of tungsten. 0.1 part per million is normal. So 500 times more? Yeah. 
definitely an anomaly on the Earth's surface. But well, where could tungsten, that amount of tungsten, come from? There's only two things that I can think of. First would be a meteorite. We didn't see a, an impact point in the epicenter, did yeah, we? No, it was I didn't notice that. Completely flat, it had no burn marks, no impact. It's going to make a perfect dimension of no. 22 feet by 15 and a half. What would be another possibility? The only other option I can think of is it came up from deep inside the core of the Earth. Think magma, think yeah. volcanoes. There are no volcanoes in that area. So those are the only two possibilities, sir? Only two I can think of. This makes me think about the story that Brent told us. As outlandish as it sounds, because there's no volcanoes in the area, it actually lends credence to the possibility that we could be talking about an entry point for an alien base deep under the ground. Would tungsten have any type of radioactive element? We were getting extremely high readings on our Geiger counter. Radioactivity, no, not at all. Well, we've certainly found something we can't explain. I mean, there's so many variables in our planet and our universe that we can't even wrap our heads around, you know? According to Jim Anderson, the only places to find concentrations of tungsten that high are in outer space or deep under the ground. In other words, the two places where aliens might live. This subject matter of UFOs, I am highly skeptical about. Yeah. But what we've seen and dealt with in this investigation, you know, talking with Brent, having Wilbur help us, the things our cameras picked up, what we physically saw with our eyes as far as the snow circle, it just leads me to be from going from one end of the spectrum to somewhere in the middle, that there's a possibility that Mount Hayes has something occurring in it, possibly alien. I'm not saying that there is, but it would need a lot more work. I mean, you're talking about possibly having to excavate the mountain. As you know, that, that'd be impossible for us to do. The amount of money, get equipment in such a remote location, there's no way that's going to happen. The theory that Mount Hayes has a UFO base is ultimately hard to prove or disprove. Whatever's going on there would take military-level resources and funding to pursue. But we have seen some very strange stuff, and we can speculate. I got thinking about the indentation we found in the snow. Doesn't it seem kind of small to you? 22 feet. A, a decent measurement, but you know, it's not obviously transporting human sized people, you know, very many of them, anyways. It's just a small little patch in the snow. You know, Wilbur was talking about little beings that, that came in his room that were only like, you know, three to four feet tall. That's pretty typical as far as the way people describe these aliens. There are other accounts of aliens that are even much smaller. For example, in the Atacama Desert of uh, South America, they've found these little mummies that are like six inches tall. Apparently, they have the features of aliens. OK, check it out. Here's the mummies. Can you see those little guys? That is strange. Think about the vast infiniteness of the universe. I mean, if we are not alone, then the odds are that there's you know, not one other race of aliens, but there could potentially be hundreds of different types of aliens. and. They could all be coming here for whatever reason. Okay. Anything's possible, right? It's true. It's a possibility. From the vastness of Alaska to the vastness of space, the question of what's out there remains. The frequency of unexplained lights over the Alaska Triangle would suggest man is not alone. But does the answer to the mysteries above lie beneath our feet? If alien life forms are responsible for the missing climber, and if Mount Hayes is the alien base it's reported to be, it could at least partially explain why so many people go missing in Alaska. February night in 2008, outside Anchorage, Alaska, a man was filming the Aurora Borealis. It was a spectacular show, but the vision he'd remember would not be in the sky. He packed up his gear and headed down the mountain.
he encountered a woman coming up. Miss? Miss? Miss, you all right? He would later describe her as looking zombified. Miss, can you hear me? Hey! He headed down and reported what he saw. Could the light show above have caused the woman's strange behavior? Bizarre stories have surrounded the Aurora Borealis throughout time. Legends claim it makes people act violently or even become self-destructive. Why did this woman wander into the wilderness? And where did she go? Whatever the cause, she was reported missing that night and never seen again. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. straight up so you know it's gonna be nice and treacherous let's do this the team begins their investigation on the northeast side of Anchorage trekking up the mountain where the missing woman Stephanie disappeared so this is a popular hike huh it's a good spot up here to see Aurora boy Alice man this is a tough climb hey guys this is the exact trail that Stephanie was on turns out they found her whole house the TV on Meat was in the sink, being thawed. All signs indicate she was coming right back. And, uh, you know, she was an experienced outdoor enthusiast and should have been experienced in these areas. And I don't like to presume this about people, but when I hear Stephanie's story, the first thing I think of is possible drug history or maybe mental problems. She had no history of either, but those would explain what happened. You guys rested up enough? Yeah. All right, let's yeah. get up there and let's do it. <sighs> That's pretty steep. I know every native group here in Alaska have their own stories of what the aurora is. Uh, some definitely more sinister than others. The aurora borealis, also called the northern lights, occurs in high latitudes where particles from the solar wind hit gas molecules in the upper atmosphere, creating a brilliant display. For millennia, the Inuit believed the lights were lanterns of demons pursuing lost souls. The Fox Indians believed they were the spirits of slain enemies rising to get revenge. Others saw them as a positive omen. Vikings in Europe thought them to be Valkyries coming to lead fallen soldiers to their final resting place. Whatever the interpretation, the lights were seen as a powerful force from beyond our realm. But down in the southeast, where I'm from, uh, the Tlingit people believe that the Aurora is were warriors that went before us. It's their spirit. Uh, that's where they, they've gone. And also, when it's, when it's red, um, that there's imminent battle in your future. You're going to be probably warring with other tribes in the area. The correlation between the Northern Lights and imminent disaster has continued into modern times. In World War II, the lights were spotted just before the London Blitzkrieg. And when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the northern lights were seen as far away as Ohio. More recently, Aurora Borealis preceded the massive earthquake and tsunami that rocked Japan in 2011. But does correlation equal causation or just coincidence? 
The belief that the auroras signal danger comes from the idea that spirits can see into the future. They see danger coming, and they want to warn people about it. But some people believe that the auroras themselves actually cause danger, that they affect people and make them act in aggressive ways. Now, that's a scary thought. OK, let's get real steep again. Oh, almost there, guys. After a really tough hike, we finally got to the peak where we could get a really clear view of the awesome aurora borealis. <sighs> oh. Whoa. Oh, it's so rich. Oh, wow. That is badass. At the top of the trail, I decided to get some EMF readings under the aurora borealis to see whether I can even read electromagnetic energy from this distance. Huh. What do you got there? Oh, oh check it wow. out. Hold me. Whoa. Electromagnetic energy right there. I'm getting some unusually high readings here. What do you make of that? Still going, man. I don't know. What's interesting to me is that on the night that Stephanie disappeared, conditions were very similar to tonight. A very active aurora borealis display. And the auroras have radiation that's invisible to the eye. When you think about the dangers of radiation, from simple sunburns to cancers that people get from cell phones, I'm wondering if the aurora borealis can affect people in ways that we just don't understand. Wait, wait. Hear that? What do you hear? Kind of a light buzzing noise. You guys can't hear that? Snap, crackle. The noise I'm hearing is very soft, but it's also very distinct. It's like having a bad electrical wire that you can hear through your walls. No, I don't hear anything. I just feel a little lightheaded. Well, that's not good. I think we need to get off this mountain. Ready to head down? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Start. It's impossible to know if Stephanie was in her right mind that night, but witnesses said that she had a glazed look on her face. This correlates with the native legends saying that the auroras can alter our perceptions. Some Inuits even believe that watching the auroras too much can make it go mad. Maybe what Jackson and Ken were feeling were symptoms of that. After their strange experience viewing the Northern Lights, the team decides they need to learn more about this phenomenon and see if it can affect human behavior. Ken and Tommy are meeting with Todd Salat, a scientist and photographer who's an expert on auroras. Come on into the wow. art cave. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah, beautiful. Very Thank impressive. You. Thank you, guys. It's kind of my life work here on the wall. Basically, what happened last night was we were getting an enhanced stream of solar wind buffeting the Earth. Hmm. And here's a model, a plasma ball, where the inner red core there, that represents the Earth. And those wild rays coming out, that's our magnetic field line. And this ball would be our magnetic shield, the magnetic field deflects most of the solar wind, but some of it comes down our magnetic poles. And those electrons, when they make a connection with the Earth's atmosphere, they start lighting up. That is a pretty concentrated dose of energy. The electrons, however, and the charged particles, they're not making it all the way to us because we have the atmosphere, which is very thick. So the, the energy coming down through the Earth is not going to affect the animals and us? I don't think so, but maybe you've heard of the HARP program up here in Alaska. Uh, there's a lot of secrecy surrounding that. So you're talking about government? It um, is, a, yeah, I believe, a government facility. HARP. The name stands for High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. It's an array of 180 antennas that beam electromagnetic waves into the ionosphere. Located near Kokona, Alaska, HARP's reported goal is to find ways to improve radio communication through the upper atmosphere. But could the enormous amounts of radiation be affecting the people in Alaska? At different wavelengths, electromagnetic energy can cook food or even fry electronics. What could it do to the human brain? I do believe they're sending energy from the ground up as opposed to you know what might be a little bit more natural aurora energy coming in from above and not really reaching the Earth so much. So it's like creating the auroras from below? Something that can, you know, simulate that same effect of the aurora? Yeah. Maybe that's why Jack's heard the buzzing sound and I got lightheaded. I certainly can't speak with any kind of expertise about what's going on there, but there might be some actual 
health hazards that we don't understand real well. Todd's revelation about the HARP program was frightening. If HARP is putting out high levels of radiation, it could potentially affect people's brains and possibly their behavior. The old practice of electroshock therapy is a very similar principle. Maybe there is a connection to Stephanie's disappearance. Well, maybe we need to look into this HARP thing. That sounds interesting. Yeah, check this out. The Northern Lights have long fascinated the people of Alaska. Legends about the Aurora's power pervade native folklore. But is there a sinister truth behind the tales? Could a version of these lights be affecting people like Stephanie and contributing to the rash of missing in the Alaska Triangle? And could that version be man-made? A connection has been made to HARP a secret government outpost first built in 1993, which is reported to study the effects of radiation beamed into the ionosphere. This is their official brochure that they put out. And the way it's worded, I mean, you can't really understand what they're saying, what they're up to. And the internet is flooded with conspiracies about that place. After making the Harp connection, we began to follow that lead. Tommy reached out to Harp in order to request a tour of the facility. Well, I got online and downloaded articles about the organization from the internet. I don't really know the science behind all this stuff. There's probably very few people that honestly do, you know? Well, how could you? They make it almost unreadable. Ken and Jax go to meet Dr. Nick Begich, Jr., an activist and author who has spent the last two decades working to expose HARP secrets. Hey guys, good to see you. Ken, we're hoping to get more information from Nick about what HARP really is and whether, in fact, it poses any type of threat to the population. Can you kind of explain what HARP is and, and how it works, the science behind it? Sure. It, it's essentially a radio transmitter, but it's not like a single antenna radio transmitter. And when you think about radio transmitters, um, the energy from a transmitter comes off of the, the source point, spreads out very rapidly, and so it becomes less and less dense with distance. So the further you get away from a radio tower, the, the weaker the signal. Sure. With HARP, it flips this around. 180 antennas fire in a specific sequence, causes the energy to focus, creates what's called a cyclotron resonance, which if you could visualize this, it would look like a corkscrewing uh, motion of energy that gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it gets higher and higher and higher. So the further out you get, and the stronger that focus, then you're able to affect environmental systems. The description that Dr. Begich is giving matches what Ken and Tommy heard. Focus energy might excite particles in the atmosphere, which might show up as artificial auroras. We've heard that they can recreate the auroras, is that true? There, the, there is a way to create um, a lighting effect, but what HARP is all about is weapons applications, um, weather modification being being one of, of many. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy stuff, it's man. It's scary, too. The idea of using weather as a weapon sounds pretty wild, but even if HARP is doing something as simple as heating pockets of air in the sky, like a microwave heats food, that would affect pressure differentials in the atmosphere, which in turn would alter wind patterns, affect cloud formations, maybe even trigger a violent storm. Do you think that something like this, the, the energy, the auroras, would have some type of effect on humans? It can do exactly that. You and I can pick that signal out. The brain will lock onto it, like dialing in a radio station. Like we could hear something beamed into our brain? The right signal will affect you on a cellular level. You could calm the population or agitate them. The issue of mind control, I'm gonna demonstrate that here in a minute for you guys that just kind of illustrates the transfer of sound directly into the human being from something other than the ears. Nick pulls out a device that he says is gonna demonstrate remote effects on the brain in a safe way. But I've got to admit, I'm rather nervous about this. What's gonna happen is the sound's gonna come in through these two transducers. So block your ears tightly so you can't hear anything external. So I want you to hold that in your hand. Touch his hand. Ooh, uh, <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> So Nick does this demonstration where he's able to somehow resonate music into my head from Jax's body without any music playing out loud. This is really weird. And then the idea of, of taking the jump from this to a wireless version of this, harp could be utilized in that way. Any part of the electromagnetic spectrum 
uh, can be pulsed, manipulated in specific ways to couple with the human body and create these kinds of uh, consciousness effects. And mostly so, theories, or do you think this stuff is? Been these done? aren't theories. These, if, if anyone who's read my work, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of source documents cited. So you can look at the 2006 protocols for the Navy. We're moving away from bombs, bullets, and ordnance towards mind control. Using those words is right in there. These are pretty unusual claims that Dr. Begich is making. I mean, hearing music in your head is one thing, but full-on mind control where someone's making you do something that you don't want to do, that's a big leap for me. Dr. Begich, some of the information that you've given us is really <laughs> kind of set us onto an interesting path here, so. Well, thank you for covering the story. Appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. After Dr. Begich's frightening accusations about Harp, the team is left to ponder their next move. Wow. That was crazy, man. You know, I'm always up for a good conspiracy, but I kind of thought, well, I mean, what he's out there preaching about seems a little out there for me. Yeah. I Let's mean, call Tommy. And... Yeah, you need to fill him in. You're right. Hello? So we just got out of the meeting with Dr. Nick Begich. It was pretty crazy. If the military really is attempting to control people's minds using energy, I mean, how sinister that is. Yeah, that doesn't seem Real, man. Have you been able to reach anyone over at Harp? I left several messages here with them. Well, let's keep trying. We need to see that place. The idea that an external force can control one's mind may seem far-fetched, but Jessica Duncan believes she experienced just that while on a solo hike through an Alaskan forest. A couple years ago, I was out bird watching a favorite place of mine near Fairbanks. Uh, I was tracking a pair of downy woodpeckers when Something changed. I felt compelled to look up at the sky and something about the way the clouds moved was eerie. And then suddenly I was filled with fear and panic. I just started running. There was nothing behind me. I don't know what I was running from. I can't really explain it. It was almost like an out of body experience. When I kind of caught my breath and started to calm down, I realized I was utterly lost. Thank God I had my compass. I was exhausted and I was miles from the road. Quite honestly, I don't know where I would be if I didn't have my compass that day. Anxious to get a first-hand look at the Harp facility, the team plots the best way to get there. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Gakona is here and the harp facility is about eight miles outside of that we still haven't heard from harp and online there are reports saying the facility is shut down but we still want to check it out so we decided we're going to go up there and have a look even though we don't have permission i'd be real interested in taking some readings because i think you know if they're technically shut down then we shouldn't be getting any right of course readings on any instrumentation or something let's get out of here yeah? We think that a covert investigation into Hart might give us some insight into what happened to Stephanie and some of the other missing people in Alaska, as well as answering some of the questions raised by Dr. Begich. It's a risk to go there uninvited, but it's a risk we've got to take. Alaska, a land of massive mountains, immense forests, and huge numbers of missing people. More than 3,000 per year are reported lost in this vast expanse. Could some of them be victims of mind control? The government-run HARP facility is known to pour massive amounts of radiation into the skies, and they're not alone. Similar facilities have sprung up the world over. Japan, China, India, Norway, Brazil, Peru. The list goes on. The original version, Sura, was built by the Soviet Union in the early 80s. Like HARP, they claim to be studying radio waves in the upper atmosphere. But some people believe their true goal was spy technology. With Sura able to eavesdrop on any wireless communication around the world, with similar claims being leveled at HARP, the team wants to know what's truly happening at this secret facility. Okay, yeah, it's looking by a sodometer here. We're about two miles out. The possible effects of a facility like HARP are pretty frightening. A study in Russia showed that 
A rise in geomagnetic activity, which causes auroras, translated to a rise in anxiety, depression, even suicide. Is that what Suru was trying to duplicate? Is that what Harp wants to control? It's important we find out what's going on here. You know, I'm assuming this is open. They've got surveillance all around, cameras, audio, everything. So we think about one of us sitting in the car while the other two of us see if we can get on foot as close as possible. So we're talking about a getaway vehicle? Yeah, in a sense, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. We're here, Ken. This is Harp. Holy I don't see any signs. Hey, a light just came on. You see that? Oh, man. A different line turned on right there by the edge of the building. Yeah, this is creepy. There's definitely some activity here. All right, guys, what do we do now? Guys, I think we're here. Might as well take some readings. I want to okay. get as close as we can. Sounds good. Tom, come over and switch seats with me. Everything I've heard about this place is extremely unsettling. I'm really not sure what to expect at this point. I think, I think we might have spotlights up here. Let's just be prepared for that. We know that HARP was designed to emit electromagnetic radiation, possibly across all different wavelengths. So we're going to use our EMF to see if that's happening. Jax. There's actually a sign that says that this facility is controlled by the United States Air Force. It's top secret, no entrance. Oh, what's that? Oh, dude, it's redlining. Check that out. This thing is not off. It is not decommissioned. These electromagnetic surges that I'm picking up with my instruments could, in fact, indicate that HARP is broadcasting some kind of rays into the atmosphere. And this, in turn, could be affecting the surrounding environment. Yeah, I'm getting crazy readings, man. What other readings can we take while we're here? Uh, I've got the spectrometer. We can do some audio frequency readings here. Well, that's interesting. We're getting, we're definitely getting a spike. Oh, you're going to have to help me. What's that mean? It means we're getting some type of audio wave we can't hear. That's how mind control works, man. As Nick Begich said, they align pretty much with brainwave activity. You all right? Yeah. Well, I say let's, um, let's do the drone. Yeah. Let's get that part done. Yeah, but check it out. We got all these power lines here. Yeah, no we kidding. Can't, we can't fly it here. Let's step back like 100 yards. That'll work. Are you OK with that? Yeah. You OK? Yeah, I'm just, let's just go. Let's go. We don't have a lot of time at this point, and we're feeling very uncomfortable. But we've got to get some readings from the air to see exactly how active this facility is. Our drone is equipped with an HD infrared camera that has a 30 times optical zoom. This will show us everything in this place to a fine detail. Go. Here we go, here we go. Go, 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 go. There you go, there you go. You OK? No. I'm feeling really. Take a knee, take a knee. I barely get the drone off the ground, and suddenly Ken's doubling over. I have no idea what's going on with him. I'm like, my stomach is in knots. Man, I, I'm sorry, dude. I got to go. We got to go. I'm bringing it home. This has all the marks of a stomach bug. Maybe it's something that Ken ate. The fact that we are right outside of heart may be affecting Ken's subconscious and making this way worse. Well, lean against me. I don't feel right, man. Hold on, hold on. We got to get this down. It's not cooperating. It's just hanging up there. I'm having trouble controlling the drone. It's like something's interfering with the signal. <laughs> Hang in there, Ken. This drone has been through a lot, so there might just be a glitch going on. But at this point, I don't really care why things are happening. I want to get Ken out of here for his own sake. <laughs> it's almost down. It's almost down. OK. All right, it's down. I can come back for it. Let's oh, get you to the car. I'm here. I'm here. Come on. Stand up. Come on. <laughs> Tommy! Yeah. Yeah. What's going on? Come on, how am I getting in the car? This is not what I thought would happen tonight. We have no choice. We have to abort this mission now. Let's get out of here. Come on, let's go. While investigating the HARP facility near Gakona, Alaska, 
Ken Gerhardt started feeling ill. I don't feel right, man. Back for it. Let's oh, get you the car. I'm here. I'm here. Come on. Stand up. After a long night battling nausea and severe anxiety, he decides to seek medical help. Knowing what I now know about HARP and their ability to affect the human mind, I'm worried that my symptoms might be caused by something being a little off mentally. So I'm seeing Curtis Walton, an expert in neurofeedback. Uh, you can take a seat right here. Neurofeedback is a therapy that helps the brain regulate the well-being of the body. If HARP messed me up, Curtis Walton is the guy that can help me out. Last night had like a major anxiety event, and it, it triggered kind of a nausea and I couldn't sleep at all. I mean, I'm kind of wrecked at this point. What I do is it can help with calm you down, yeah. all right? Um, neurofeedback, it deals with the brain electricity. It starts regulating what the symptoms you came in for. Using electrodes to measure Ken's brain activity, Curtis will present a series of images and sounds that guide Ken's brain waves back to optimal levels. T4 minus. I'm going to start at uh, 5 millihertz. The lower the frequency, the faster and the better the results. We worked our way down to 0.1 millihertz. Because we're at such a low frequency, it helps. That's what helps in the calming down, the regulation. So how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling very serene. My anxiety is, it's gone. I mean, it's, okay. yeah, I feel much so, better. This process is pretty amazing. And it makes you realize how easily your mind can be manipulated. Doesn't it make sense that governments might try to weaponize this? Do you think it's possible that my brain could have actually been affected by these magnetic bursts of energy? They got therapy out there called transcranial stimulation. Okay. It works wonders for depression. They pump magnetic waves into you. You know, correctly, it works great, but anything incorrectly will cause problems. Transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS, involves placing a magnetic coil near the patient's head and sending calculated magnetic impulses into their brain. TMS can alter mood, affect the ability to speak, and even trigger physical movements of the extremities. If those results can be achieved with a single coil, what is possible with a massive antenna array? Thanks again so much. No problem. You've done wonders for me. Hearing Curtis talk about this technology has me convinced that heart could have caused my breakdown. The ability of their technology to affect the human mind poses a real threat. The thought of mind control is an ongoing fear for Nicole Dennis after a life-changing experience in her youth. A few years ago, um, I was home with my older brother uh, in my kitchen. We were just washing dishes, and all of a sudden, I got this screaming pain in my head. Just out of nowhere, this loud pounding, and it hurt so badly, I dropped what I was doing, and I just grabbed my head, hoping it would stop. And then I looked and noticed my brother was experiencing the same thing. It was terrifying. And then after a few seconds, it stopped. I asked my brother what that was, but he didn't answer. He just quietly walked out of the house. And he never returned. He wouldn't have just left us. Something changed him that day. I am so terrified that it's going to happen to me. Based on Ken's extreme experience near Harp, Jack sets up a meeting with another possible victim named Wes that he found through a support group online. Hey, how you doing? Jax wants to see if there's any sort of pattern to these attacks. So tell me a little bit what you got going on. I mean, uh, you're involved with these support groups, right? Uh, for TIs, targeted individuals, uh -huh. dealing with uh, covert uh, harassment from the government. You know, back when I was a teenager, I had an experience. I had this bomb go off in my head. It was almost this, this throbbing, pounding feeling. And I fell to the floor, and you almost go blank. It's like this blackout state. You just kind of disappear. Wes's comments about being in a trance or zombie-like state made me immediately think about Stephanie, how she wandered up that mountain before she went missing. 
Have you ever been in that state and then ended up somewhere physically that you weren't? It almost feels like sleepwalking. That's, I mean, that just must feel insane it's, when you come out of it, right? It's retracing the steps to figure out what you've done and where you've been. So how do you deal with your symptoms? Uh, we wear protective hats. Uh, they look just like normal. Like what you're wearing right now? Yeah. Can I see it? Yeah. Is that a foil? Yeah. OK. Well, Wes showed me his tinfoil hat. I got to be honest. I was thinking, what is going on here? And, and you feel it works pretty well? Yeah. It makes me, you know, it's like a security blanket almost. Gotcha. Yeah. People think we're crazy, but we're not crazy. He really feels that having tinfoil in his hat protects him from having his mind controlled and other signals going into his head. What do you know about Harp? I know that a lot of the guys in the uh, in the support group for TIs have been talking about Harp, and they believe that that has something to do with everything that's been going on with us. These guys are convinced that Harp is doing terrible things, but all this talk of wearing tinfoil hats and mind control is just a little too science fiction for me. Have you ever been up to the facility? I haven't. I'm too scared. As much as I'd like to write this guy off, I've done enough interviews to know that the fear in his eyes is real. He definitely feels like he's under attack. The team's investigation into HARP has uncovered some frightening possibilities. That's how mind control works, man. Electromagnetic energy affects everything from electronics. He's not cooperating. He's just hanging up there. To our physical health. Like, my stomach is in knots. It's almost done. Is the facility manipulating this energy to target individuals? Are some of the Northern Lights a reflection of HARP's covert deeds? Local resident Shayla Altus believes she witnessed one of these evil deeds firsthand. I live in Gakona with my husband. Um, that's where Harp is. One night, we were watching a movie, and after it finished, um, he said he was going to go outside and move the trash cans down to the street. I heard this banging and noises outside, and it was my husband. He was yelling like he was about to fight someone but there was nobody there. I banged on the window, but he didn't respond at all. And he kept throwing the trash cans at some invisible enemy. And I grabbed him um, to try to break through, and his eyes were completely glazed over. I was so scared. Um, it's really not like him. I was finally able to calm him down and get him back in the house. But in the morning, he didn't, he didn't remember anything. He just said he had a really, really bad headache. Okay, how are you feeling? Ah, uh, man, I'm feeling 100% better, guys. We had us worried. Something weird was going on at that facility. After having to abort their drone investigation of Harp because of Ken's sudden illness, the team has decided to take a much bolder approach. They're going to fly over the HARP facility in a helicopter, looking for stronger proof that HARP is active and dangerous. You gonna be all right going back there? Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm anxious to fly over and see how close we can get. We definitely don't want to get in trouble, especially where the government's concerned. But the area around HARP is public airspace, so we're going to use that to our advantage and see what we can learn. Well, here we go. It's our ride. Yes, sir. Hold up here, guys. Let's make sure we have everything. K2 meter, Geiger counter, magnetometer. Yeah, we got it covered, man. I'm gonna be able to take all kinds of readings with this stuff. You know I met with Wes, right? He's had his mind controlled. Yeah, well, one of the things he showed me was that he lines his hats and clothing with tinfoil. He says it works. Really? I gotta admit, this is very hokey, but I got us all tinfoil. I'm totally aware that the tinfoil hat is a cliche. In my experience, there are some people with mental health issues that do feel like radio waves are coming into their brain and they possibly might be having mind control. But in this type of unknown situation, and given what happened to Ken, why not be fully prepared? The aluminum foil does reflect radiation, as anyone knows who's accidentally put it in a microwave. So why not give it a shot? We're all set? It's a very clear night. Perfect conditions under which to fly over the heart facility. This way, we can take some really in-depth readings and tell whether or not the heart facility is still active. I'm a little nervous, but I'm feeling much better than the other night. That was pretty scary, man. 
This is the very first time I've ever flown in a helicopter at night, and honestly, it's very unsettling, particularly knowing that we're going to be flying over the HARP facility in a covert operation. How far are we from HARP here? We're about five miles out right now. I can get you uh, pretty close. We probably won't be able to fly right over it. Entirely different up here at night. Hard to make out your bearings where you're at. I, I don't know which way we're going. Hey guys, look, look. Wow. Holy Seeing the Aurora Borealis at night from a helicopter is a once in a lifetime experience. But it's also strange because I'm not sure what it is at this point. Is this something metaphysical like legends say, or something natural like scientists say, or maybe something man-made by heart? Uh, we're actually coming up on it right now. There it hey, is. there it is. This is pretty much as close as we're going to be able to get. Wow. Very ominous, though. I mean, look at the way it's just kind of standing out here in the middle of nowhere. Flying over a top secret facility, we're not going to have a lot of time. We've got to get our readings quickly and get out of here. I'm going to bring on the K2. Take some. Uh, Measurements here, Jack. Will you help me out with the uh, 3.83 documentation? Yes, sir. The K2 EMF reader is the quickest way to see if there's any electromagnetism coming from this facility. This will tell us if HARP is active or not. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that's crazy. Right up. We are definitely getting massive readings. Massive reading on the K2. Electromag. Oh, look, it's redlining, guys. Yeah. See that? Taking out. I see that, yeah. Whoa. What's happening? Something's wrong. Keep what's going on? Well, I'm not sure. We definitely have a disturbance of some sort going on here. Holy cow. Holy As they attempt to fly over the Harp facility, the team suddenly experiences some frightening trouble with their chopper. We definitely have a disturbance of some sort going on here. We need to get out of here, guys. Yeah. Oh. Holy cow. Holy cow. Oh. Holy cow. Look at the compass. It's all over the place. It's not right. I think it's time to get out of here, guys. Yeah, this, this, this it doesn't feel right, man. Now, what's going on? More than turbulence. Okay, let me get it under control here first. Okay, I got it here. We're going to go ahead and head on out of here. Oh, uh, good deal. Yes. I got some sweaty palms, guys. Man, my stomach's upside down right now. Yeah. You all right, Ken? Yeah. Um, that was weird. That was really, really weird. I think we have enough data now where we can uh, definitely make some determinations. That was utterly terrifying. Right as I was getting strong EMF readings from HARP, our helicopter pilot lost control. We know that electromagnetic waves can affect or damage instruments on a helicopter, so maybe that's what was going on. All that matters is the pilot regain control of the craft and I'm glad to be back on the ground, safe and sound. Between the readings and the way the helicopter was malfunctioning, no. something's going on. This place is supposed to be shut down, guys. What we felt tonight and what we saw the other day with Ken, this place is not shut down. Yeah, definitely not. Something's going on. Our EMF readings strongly suggest that the heart facility is still active, despite the fact that they're telling us that the facility's been shut down. And when you consider our experience on the helicopter, it suggests that there's something more going on than what the public knows. These government facilities are covert, and they may be working on something that we may never get concrete proof of. Whatever the team just experienced, at least it didn't involve mind control this time. You guys okay? He's glad to be on the ground. We're on the ground. We're okay. <laughs> that was crazy. 
How are you feeling, Ken? You're looking a little yellow in there. Oh, imagine if I didn't have the tinfoil. You know, I'm a little bit rattled right now. That was a wild ride. Yeah, you're the Alaska native. I mean, how do you feel about this harp stuff? Well, um, it is our belief that, that um, the aurora, the lights, are, are the spirits that have gone before us, and that they're sending us messages. So with the readings that we got and our equipment today, um, I think the modern technology could be replicating the ancient phenomenon in a dangerous way. Let's consider the facts. We know that HARP is broadcasting waves into the ionosphere. They are essentially creating geomagnetic anomalies. I mean, we experienced that tonight. Mm -hmm. They're trying to essentially recreate the aurora borealis. Right. And that there's so many possible things that they can you know, achieve with that. They're beaming frequencies back at the Earth that could be used for, you know, weather control or mind control or, you know, all kinds of crazy things. They're saying that they're doing it for defense, for communications, for all these beneficial things, to check the ozone. But um, chaos theory dictates that one tiny stimulus can create all types of side effects or chain reactions that are completely beyond our comprehensions. The other side of it, I mean, you got to know China and Russia are all involved in this kind of stuff. So if we're not doing it and working on it, then the technology is going to another country. And we gotta, gotta look at it on that side too. For me, the harp technology is a lot like the nuclear weapons race. If someone else has a bomb, the best way to protect yourself is for you to have a bomb. We may never know because they're not giving any answers. What began as an investigation into the Northern Lights ends as a potential international conspiracy. It's long been known that strange behaviors can be caused by electrical imbalances in the brain. It now seems possible those glitches can be caused by government technology. The team personally experienced high electromagnetic signals from HARP, as well as frightening occurrences near the facility. But as long as governments hold secrets, we may never know if they're the reason so many go missing in Alaska.